Ah, the Silver Age. Perhaps the greatest decade for heavyweights in boxing history. Perhaps. Well, one thing is almost certain. This is the last great era for heavyweights. Coming out of the Lost Generation's decade of the 1980s, the heavyweight division had seen a renewed spark at the arrival of Kid Dynamite. The man who had unified the division as its first undisputed champion since Leon Spinks in his upset over Muhammad Ali in 1978. Despite the roar Tyson evoked throughout the division and boxing world, he wasn't the only dominant champion of the 80s. Tyson's dominance of the latter half of the 80s had further overshadowed the reign of the great Larry Holmes. The two clashed in the 80s, and Tyson stopped Holmes convincingly. The late 80s also saw a few more precursors of the 90s. Evander Holyfield, after unifying the cruiserweight division, took the leap to heavyweight. George Foreman returned from his retirement 10 years after the Jimmy Young upset. Super heavyweight finalists Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe turned pro. Heavyweight gold medalist Ray Mercer entered the pros. My point is, the 90s were shaping up to be an interesting time for the division, with old and new faces gearing up to take their chance at reaching for the brass ring. To do so, however, they would have to dethrone arguably the most dominant champion ever in Iron Mike Tyson. In 1989, the documentary Champions Forever released, featuring the five great champions from the Golden Age 1970s. It featured the timelines of their reigns and added interviews from the great men in relation to their exploits and how they all elevated one another through rivalry. The documentary is a must-see, and I had to include it here as I missed it in the 80s timeline. Also in it, does Big George Foreman continue to declare that he will regain the heavyweight title? Larry Holmes alluded he wasn't quite done either. Best of luck, old man Foreman, and I hope we see you come back too, old man Holmes. Teach these young fellows how to box. So-called old-timers George Foreman and Jerry Cooney opened the decade in The Preacher and The Puncher. Clearly, no one took this bout seriously regarding either man, considering it was cast aside as the geezers at Caesars. Foreman's comeback had been mostly against journeymen and relative nobodies, leading to everyone overlooking his desire to be world champion as nothing more than wishful thinking. Cooney had been sporadic since his loss to Larry Holmes in 1982. When they met on this night, both men impressed the boxing world. Cooney became one of the hard. only men to stagger George, George in his comeback, and Foreman added some much needed credibility to his second career when he blew Cooney away in the second round. It was one of the coldest knockouts in heavyweight history. Tony retired after the bout. In your mind, are you too big for the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson? I would probably knock him out a little quicker. Same thing that happened to Jerry Coney tonight would definitely happen to Mike Tyson. Tyson is back as the bout was billed. The dominant, undefeated, undisputed champion had but one job to secure 
a mega payday against impending rival Evander Holyfield. Beat James Buster Douglas the same way he'd beaten all of his other opponents in the 80s. A mere formality on the road. Douglas was a 42 to 1 betting underdog and it was clear that Tyson and his team weren't concerned with him. Beyond this, the promoters already had concrete plans for the bout between Tyson and Holyfield to take place on June 18th. Unfortunately for Tyson, a perfect storm had brewed in the lead up to the Tokyo Dome clash. Douglas was more motivated than ever to win after the passing of his mother. He was in the best shape of his career both mentally and physically, the opposite of the reigning champion who had been on a silent downward spiral since departing from his original fight team that stemmed from his father figure Custy Amato. Tyson's team, assuming the champ would run through Douglas, didn't even bring the necessary components to take care of their injured fighter. Tyson was floored in sparring by Greg Page two weeks before the bout, and ominous reports said Tyson would potentially be his own downfall. But none of the reports believed it would come against Buster Douglas specifically. Again, Buster was the most motivated he'd ever been, as was noted by those in his camp. It's quite impressive how he took the passing of his mother and turned those 23 days before the fight into the ultimate motivation rather than it zapping him of his drive and will. Adding to this, Douglas watched the mother of his son suffer a severe kidney ailment and himself caught the flu a day before the fight. Bobby Brown claims he and Mike partied like crazy the night before the fight. According to Bobby, Mike said Buster Douglas was nothing more than an amateur he didn't need to prep for. In summary, everyone, including Tyson, was expecting another 90 second blowout a la Spinks. Well, everyone except Douglas, his camp, and the Columbus Dispatch, which published an article placing their faith in their hometown fighter, forecasting the biggest upset in history. Alrighty, let's get to the fight. Douglas outboxed Tyson for the majority of the fight, wearing him down until the moment came when Tyson decked Douglas with a vicious uppercut that sent him to the canvas. It looked like Tyson had saved his championship after all, until Buster rose from the dead. Long count or not, Douglas survived the round, and the moment truly came in the next round when he blasted Iron Mike to the canvas with a devastating combination. Mike struggled to find his mouthpiece on his way to his feet and failed to beat the count as the world watched the unbelievable. The once invincible champion had been nerfed to size by an apparent nobody. In the biggest upset in boxing history and perhaps even sports history, James Buster Douglas had just become the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. The heavyweight division had been flipped on its head and the dream match between Tyson and Holyfield had seemingly been thrown to the smoke. In the aftermath, Don King wanted the result voided on claims Douglas received a long count. Initially, the WBC and WBA agreed and refused to recognize Buster, but severe backlash led them to join the IBF in recognizing the new champ. Among this backlash were threats of chief powers withdrawing from the WBC. Douglas sued to break his contract with Don King on the grounds. King voided it when he tried to overturn his win. King would receive the promotion rights to a rematch, but Douglas would first have to defend against Evander Holyfield, an event which King would have no involvement. 
The upset as a whole not only ruined Tyson Holyfield, but also a Tyson Page matchup, which would have been interesting given Page dropped Mike in sparring. It also ruined a potential Tyson Foreman dream matchup, something I'm still irate didn't happen. None of these matchups would happen, nor would Tyson and Douglas ever meet for a rematch. Despite the many rumors swirling around all three would-be matchups. Tyson Douglas, like Tate Weaver a decade before it, changed the direction of the entire division and is worth a what-if on if Mike had won to come down the line here on Boxingpedia. Why did you win this fight that nobody on the planet gave you? Mother. Mother. In what mother. God bless your heart. The WBA's number two and three ranked contenders, respectively, Donovan Razor Ruddock and former WBA world champion Michael Dynamite Dokes were fighting mad. The two men exchanged blows for an even contest up until the fourth round, in which arguably the most vicious knockout came when Ruddick caught Dokes with a hybrid hooker cut. As Dokes lies stunned on the ropes, Ruddick finished him with a sharp right and left, followed by a wound up left. Dokes had been finished by the smash and lie unconscious on the mat as celebrations ensued for the victorious Ruddick. Big George returned three months after vanquishing Jerry Cooney and did the same to Mike Jamison. The bout saw Foreman fluctuate his tempo in accordance with Jamison's resistance, culminating in two knockdowns. A wild uppercut in the third sent Jamison's mouthpiece to oblivion and froze him in purgatory. Foreman dropped Jamison twice, once in the third and again in the fourth for the stoppage. Before we move on, in the pre-fight, Foreman stated how Mike Tyson losing the title didn't change anything. He was still going after the belt, no matter who had it. In fact, he was only calling out Tyson because he had the belt, not because Tyson was his goal. 21 straight wins in his comeback now. Evander Holyfield stopped Seamus McDonough in four rounds, dropping him twice in the first round. A necessary tune-up for Evander to keep the wheels rolling, so to say, before challenging for the title. Sadly, it wasn't to be against Iron Mike, and questions would remain for years. A doubleheader that may have been hinting at a potential clash between the headliners. On June 16th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, George Foreman stopped Jose Adelson Rodriguez in the second round to add further credibility to his comeback as Rodriguez was the first top 10 ranked opponent Foreman had faced. In the main event, Mike Tyson embarked on his road back and stopped former two-time amateur conqueror Henry Tillman in the first round. It was sweet revenge for Tyson and fuel for onlookers who felt the loss in Tokyo was a fluke win for Douglas. The most, Tyson was still the best heavyweight in the world and had had an off night against Douglas. A rematch with Douglas would surely answer all questions. If Douglas could defend the title against the number one contender, Evander Holyfield. Big George returned to the squared circle against journeyman Ken Lacusta. The hometown hero of the night, Lacusta, was a sparring partner of Mike Tyson's in his preparation for Buster Douglas. 
261 pound foreman easily outmatched the 216 pound smaller man with the end coming in the third. A leaping left hook from George dropped Lacusta, but to his credit, he would answer the count and lash out with an almost destiny altering overhand right that rattled Foreman and woke the crowd up. Foreman, sensing the tide, turned up the heat and showed how vastly superior he was when he finished Lacusta off shortly after. That shot from Lacusta must have had Foreman's life flash before his eyes. Imagine the comeback ending right there. Yeah, right. Foreman moved to 68 and two on his career. 70 fights, wow, not many make it that far. Also, Foreman entered this bout ranked fourth by the WBC, seventh by the WBA, 10th by the IBF, fifth by the WBO, fourth by the NABF, and seventh by the USBA. It's safe to say the old man had proven he was not a joke and was coming for them belts. A slugfest through and through. They tagged one another in the first and both fighters tasted the canvas in the second. Johnny Deploy was knocked down twice, however, and did rise from the second but the referee called it off as Johnny looked to be in a different dimension. Good, quick buffet of brain damage for all you savages like myself. In one of the great underrated slugfests in boxing history, merciless Ray Mercer and schmokin' Burt Cooper took one another to hell. The bout was Cooper's first defense of the NABF title and would see him taste a canvas in the first round after a solid right from Mercer. Somewhere in the madness, Cooper broke Mercer's jaw. After 12 rounds of nonstop brutal action, Mercer was awarded a unanimous decision and the title. To this day, Mercer sees this bout as one of his toughest and has love for the fallen warrior, Burt Cooper. Four months after the Dokes horror story, Razor Ruddick returned and scored a similarly terrifying knockout of Camuel Odom. When the bell rung to end the second, the two had a stare down and Ruddick threw a left that knocked Odom down. He was penalized. In the third, Odom came on strong with the crowd cheering him on, but Ruddick struck back. He landed a right uppercut, a right hook, and finally, the smash. Odom collapsed backwards into the corner and would fail to beat the count. It was even in the same spot in the ring as the Doke's baptism. Odom timbered backwards and appeared lifeless on his way down. Razor Ruddock appeared to be the most dangerous heavyweight in the world. He expressed his frustration with being ducked in the post fight. He wanted the undisputed title and didn't care who had it, be it Tyson, Foreman, Douglas, or Holyfield. He just wanted his shot. A challenge to all the heavyweights in the, in the um, division. Tyson Foreman, um, Evander Holyfield, Buster Douglas. I'm ranked number three in the heavyweight division. And um, I think they should acknowledge the fact that I'm there. Do not overlook me. I'm here to stay. In his first real test since turning pro the previous year, the Eddie Futch trained Olympic silver medalist, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo dominated faded ex-champion Pinklin Thomas until the bout was finally stopped after eight harsh rounds. Many onlookers felt the fight should have been stopped much sooner than it was. Ringside doctors, the referee, and Pinklin's own corner were questioned on commentary as to why they allowed Bo's barrage to continue for as long as it did. How different would this fight have been if it had taken place in Pinklin's heyday? 
Riddick Bowe had gained some legitimacy with this win over one of the 1980s best heavyweights. In an easy mode first round knockout, Big George Foreman shoved aside Terry Anderson and came ever closer to a world title opportunity. And he did it wearing trunks that may have been the same trunks he wore on his way to the top in the early 70s. He was hoping to face off against the winner of the Douglas Holyfield matchup soon. At 42 years old, sooner rather than later would be best for the ex-champion. Foreman said after how he felt that his power had finally fully returned to him for the first time since the Rumble in the Jungle. 69 victories, 65 knockouts, only two losses, one to the greatest of all time, and another to an underrated 70s contender who should have arguably beaten the greatest. The next time we check in on Big George, it'll be his chance to banish the cloud of Zaire and regain his honor. Was it to be? We'll see. The foreman is someone to be reckoned with. You know, I have my eye on you, George. The possibility that uh, James Buster Dulles is going after George Foreman. Judgment Day was on. On the undercard of the event, rising star Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, took on fringe contender Burt Cooper. Cooper had put on a good showing against Ray Mercer, compounded by the fact that he was a natural cruiserweight who'd made the jump to heavyweight. Cooper punched Bo to the body during the stare down, to which Bo returned the favor. Riddick would go on to knock Cooper out at the conclusion of the second round, increasing his stock in the heavyweight sweepstakes. In the main event, undisputed champion James Buster Douglas would defend his title against the universally recognized number one contender, Evander, the real deal, holy field. Douglas had clearly fallen off since his upset of Tyson and came in both overweight and unmotivated. Holyfield, on the other hand, came in on top of his game. Holyfield easily controlled the first two rounds, outlanding and outpacing the ill-prepared Douglas. In the third round, Douglas made one of the worst mistakes a fighter can make, something he did consistently in fact. He led with a wide uppercut. Holyfield capitalized with an assassin accurate counter straight right that sent Douglas to the canvas. The manner by which Tyson's conqueror gave up was frustrating. After landing hard on his left side, he checked his face for blood and simply rolled over on his back. Obviously, Buster failed to beat the count. And the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world was the real deal. Holyfield would receive flack for not beating Tyson to become champion, but surely a bout would be put together between the two soon enough to square such criticism away, right? Douglas, meanwhile, would briefly retire into an unhealthy lifestyle that saw him balloon to 400 pounds and enter a diabetic coma. He recovered and made a mild comeback in the mid-90s. This is always the worst time to ask about a future, but do you think about that now?
What was to be the grand finale of a perfect series of movies didn't go as planned. Rocky V returned to the series' roots after Rocky IV had pushed the bar to almost comic book level heights. Real life boxer Tommy Morrison starred as Tommy the Machine Gun, a pupil Rocky takes on in his forced retirement after the war with Ivan Drago. The film sees Pauly get tricked by the family accountant into signing over power attorney, after which the Balboa finances are blown through a failed real estate flip by said accountant. This leads to the cast returning to the old neighborhood, Rocky neglecting his son in favor of guiding Tommy, and the corrupt George Washington Duke destroying the bond built between Rocky and Tommy. Rocky has heartwarming flashbacks to Mickey throughout the film. Duke attempts to goad Rocky out of retirement on multiple occasions to no success. On the side, Rocky's son, Robert, now in public school, learns to fight to deal with the school bullies. Ultimately, Rocky and Tommy score off in the streets to settle Tommy's grudge. The boxing world refuses to acknowledge Tommy as the true champion because Union Kane was nothing more than a paper champion. Rocky outduels Tommy, squares away Duke with a body shot in the aftermath, and retreats to his family, vowing to never jeopardize his relationship with Adrian or Robert again. Rocky and Robert climb the steps one last time, and a timeless montage of the five films closes the franchise for the next 16 years. It's by far the worst of the franchise, but it isn't a horrible movie. In fact, the work print of the film almost puts it on par with the others, in my opinion at least. To round out a stock hiking 1990, Razor Ruddick finished the outmatched Mike Rouse in the opening round. Bob Sheridan remarked how everyone knew Ruddick would knock the big guy out. It was just a question of when. Well, it happened with the second knockdown and Razor Ruddick was looking as sharp as ever. Get this man in the title picture already. Mike Tyson embracing the hard way back in his last bout under HBO would take on Alex, the Destroyer, Stewart, in an easy demolition job that saw the former champion drop Stewart three times. Tyson left HBO because of Larry Merchant's comments after the bout on Tyson choosing to fight Stewart. If HBO brought back Merchant, Tyson was gone. That would be the case, and Tyson made his way over to Showtime. Tyson's easy destruction of Stewart, an ex-Holyfield opponent, only provided further fuel to the narrative that mighty Mike was still the true champion. To round off 1990, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, but he wasn't the people's champion. That honor still belonged to mighty Mike Tyson. The two were on a collision course to decide the true champion in the coming 1991. Without a doubt, the ring's upset of the year was Buster Douglas destroying the myth of Mike Tyson. Tokyo Douglas was the pinnacle form of an otherwise unrealized fighter. Ring Magazine didn't select a heavyweight round of the year, but for the sake of our retrospective, it's got to be the first round of Mercer Cooper. Mercer sent Cooper to the canvas. Cooper returned to his feet, and a pattern began in the round that would last the entire fight, an endless back and forth slugfest. Ring Magazine, again, didn't grant the heavyweight's fight of the year, 
But for this retrospective, it's the grand upset of Buster Douglas over Mike Tyson. The heavyweights did not receive the Fighter of the Year honor, but for us, it's got to be Big George Foreman. The born again Foreman showed the world he was legit in 1990 and was on course to put the division on notice in 1991. As noted in 1989, Ring Magazine discontinued its championship. I neglected to switch the titling to discontinued for 1989, so we'll start here. Still, remember that 1989 should also say discontinued as opposed to vacant. The Ring title wouldn't return until June of 2002, which we'll cover when we get to a timeline of the 2000s heavyweight boxing division. Donovan Razor Ruddick was on the hunt for a marquee opponent exiting 1990 and had his sights set on a title fight with Evander Holyfield. This fell through when Holyfield instead opted to face George Foreman. Inaugural WBO champion Francesco Damiani Fought twice on the year, winning both, but neither bout was for the title. He would put the title on the line, however, to open the next year. Riddick Bowe won his other six fights on the year and moved to 21-0. and Bowe went 13-0 and the previous year, 1989, his debut year. Lennox Lewis won all eight of his fights on the year, moving to 14-0. All of his victories on the year but one came by stoppage. The lone warrior, Ozzy Ocasio, became the first man to survive Lennox. Only other time Lennox didn't stop an opponent was in a DQ win the previous year. Lewis went 6-0 his debut year, 1989. On February 23rd, Buster Douglas refereed the WWF's main event three matchup between Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man, Randy Savage. It was supposed to be Mike Tyson, but Tokyo happened. Inadvertently, this caused a butterfly effect of sorts. The WWF's golden age ended, the Ultimate Warrior failed to replace Hulkamania, and WCW would grow to overtake WWF in the ratings. Tyson would, however, appear in the WWF eight years later, which would turn out to be better anyway, because it aided the wrestling promotion in the Monday Night Wars against WCW. In fact, Tyson's cameo of sorts marked a turning point for the WWF, as they maintained the momentum he gave them. His 1998 impact showed that he may have saved the WWF back in 1990 beforehand. This all, of course, is a story for another timeline on another channel. Be looking out. On April 4th, an 80s bred rematch saw Bone Crusher Smith score a win over Mike Hercules Weaver via unanimous decision. Back in 1986, Bone Crusher stopped Weaver in one round. Overall, 1990 showed that there were many contenders for the title. The demolition of Tyson's invincibility aura only opened the playing field further, but there was still a chance to restore it in full if Tyson could reclaim his title from Evander Holyfield. The world anxiously awaited the truth. To open the year, rising contender Tommy Morrison would stop 80s contender James Quick Tillis in the first round by three knockdown rule. Morrison increased his stock well enough here with the first notable name to grace his resume. 
Tillis would continue fighting for a decade into 2001 before retiring. Right after Morrison showcase, Bruce Seldon engaged Jose Ribalta. The opening bell saw Ribalta land a right that put Seldon down for good. Or so it seemed. Seldon ascended from the mat as if he were a missile and came back to stop Ribalta in the third. I swear it's always a good show with the Atlantic City Express. You'll see what I mean as we go on. As touched on in the 80s timeline, Francesco Damiani and Ray Mercer got it on with the WBO title hanging in the balance. It was a battle between an Olympic gold medalist, Mercer, and silver medalist, Damiani. Damiani was winning the affair before Mercer punched his nose into his skull with an uppercut. The champion failed to answer the count, and there was a new WBO heavyweight champ in merciless Ray Mercer. He was looking scary on his rise to the top. Wow, what an opening to 1991. These three exciting matchups on one card. In the simplistically build, let's do it, undefeated rising contender Tommy the Duke Morrison took on former world champion Pinklin Thomas in a squash match. Morrison had been rolling in popularity and success, only highlighted by his starring role in Rocky V. Morrison battered Thomas for all of one round. Pinklin quit on his stool, and Morrison had claimed another notable name for his resume. Two names from the 80s in the span of two months. One of your rare losses came in the amateur ranks in the Olympic trials to Ray Mercer. And I know that you want to face Ray Mercer, who is the WBO heavyweight champ. Uh, how far away is that? Uh, it's a possibility that that may occur uh, possibly in July. Ray's uh, is a good oh. fighter. He's a good oh. puncher. That's a fight that certainly will happen uh, hopefully in the near future. Former Olympic gold medalist Tyrell Biggs had fizzled out since his loss to a peak Mike Tyson in the 80s, but he was still formidable enough. Biggs had his hands full when he took on up-and-coming prospect and Olympic silver medalist Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Bo wore Biggs down leading into the eighth round where he dropped Biggs twice. Referee Frank Cappuccino stopped the fight and Riddick Bowe had added another notable name to his resume en route to the world title picture. Because I needed to work, you know. I could have took him anytime I got ready. I hadn't fought in uh, a couple of months. But um, I don't know who ever said Tyrell couldn't punch. He can't punch. In his year opener, Lennox Lewis clashed with Gary Mason. It was Mason's second fight after a brief retirement due to a detached retina. Lewis won the fight by technical knockout in the seventh when referee Larry O'Connell stopped the action over Mason's swollen shut right eye. A good showing for Lennox in this step up in opponent quality. Prophetically promoted as the fight of the year, arguably at least, Universally recognized numbers one and two contenders mighty Mike Tyson and Donovan Razor Ruddick met in a title eliminator to see who would face undisputed champion Evander the Real Deal Holyfield. The two warriors talked a good deal of trash before the bout and had to be restrained more often than not. Ruddick assured that he would put Tyson to sleep again after the lesser Buster Douglas had already done so. Tyson infamously exclaimed that if he doesn't die, it doesn't count. If he's not dead, it doesn't count. Tyson and Ruddick proved their rankings as they slugged it out with some bombs that would have finished any other man. Ruddick was dropped twice in the second and third rounds before referee Richard Steele called the bout in the seventh after a barrage from Tyson sent Ruddick staggering to the ropes. Many felt the stoppage was premature and called for a rematch to settle the score as a free-for-all broke out in the ring. 
despite the two fighters embracing in peace. Once again, a prospective match between Tyson and Holyfield was derailed. A surprising amount to unpack here in the return of the Easton Assassin. As he alluded to in Champions Forever, he's back. Larry made short work of Tim Anderson scoring the TKO in the opening round, and it's said Larry broke his opponent's ribs. It was Larry's first fight since being stopped by Mike Tyson in 1988, which itself was a comeback fight from Larry's 1986 defeat to Michael Spinks. Would this comeback fall through, or would Larry stick to his quest to regain the belts? Of course, the old man comeback comparisons were made between Larry and Big George. It was forecasted on commentary that Larry would have a tougher time than George because it's generally harder to return to form as a boxer than as a puncher. As if he'd somehow heard this, Larry said in his post-fight interview how he was in the ring from here on to fight. No heavy movement, just to get his man out of there. Judging by how he stalked Anderson in the short bout, he wasn't joking. It's worth noting, it took Big George four rounds to get Anderson out back in 1987. Speaking of Foreman, can we finally expect these two old lions to lock horns now that Larry is back too? I guess we'll see. All right, let's address the if you know, you know elephant in the room. For those who don't know, Tim Anderson is currently serving a life sentence for murder. Story is quite the tragedy involving fight fixing and poison. I'll address it down the line in a short, perhaps. Oh, wait, we can't move on yet. Remember the infamous drop kick Larry delivered to Trevor Burbick 10 years after their title bout? We've arrived, for this is the day of destiny. Nice shot, champ. The missile was back in action, this time against the atomic bull Oliver McCall. It was a grit and grind affair that saw McCall snatch Seldon's O with a ninth round TKO. McCall dropped Selden three times for the forced stoppage after trailing on all cards. And yes, Selden rose quickly from the first two knockdowns, but there was nothing funny about these. Four months after his final title defense, light heavyweight champion Michael Moore made the move to heavyweight ready to test himself in the marquee division as some others of his weight class had done before him to varying results. His exam came in the form of Terry Davis. Could the former WBO champ translate well? In short, yes thus far. In the second, Moore began to have his way, landing the left at will before landing anything he wanted. It took referee Randy Newman a while to step in, but thank goodness he did. And so, a new journey began for Double M. Did he ascend to the top of the heavyweight mountain? We'll find out. Welcome to the Battle of the Ages. Obviously billed as such to reflect the age and career gaps between the two warriors. It was also a Battle of the Ages in that it was between two of the best fighters from the two best eras, or ages, in the division's history. Undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight, champion of the world, Evander Holyfield took on a very game, Big George Foreman. Foreman had earned legitimacy and was ready to reclaim the title he lost to Muhammad Ali back in 1974 
by vanquishing the cloud of Zaire. Quick side note, the music that I use in my boxing intro comes from Foreman's entrance for this fight. If anyone has any information as to where I can access the real song, Big Fat George, please let me know. This event was a good example of how far Foreman's image had come since his first career. He was by far the fan favorite and had charisma oozing from his pores. Holyfield had yet another shadow to fight out of. A crazy turnaround if you recall George's past as the Darth Vader of the division. Though Evander got the better of Foreman over the 12 round scuffle, George showed that he too was the real deal as he managed to stun his much younger opponent on multiple occasions. Foreman's once evident stamina issue appeared to be a thing of the past as he had no issue hanging with Holyfield. Not only did George hammer Evander with shots that had the champ wondering if he'd lost teeth, but he took the best that the real deal had to offer. It was a unanimous decision title defense for Holyfield, and yet another claim to legitimacy for the old lion, George Foreman. Fighting against a well-blessed man, George Foreman, you prove that, you know, he's very tough. A lot of people take George for granted. He got a lot of boxing skills. He's strong, and I think he's very competitive. What's next for Evander? We'd love to fight Mike Tyson, but we can't fight Mike Tyson as long as King is there. We're going to fight somebody. If it's Mike Tyson, fine. If not, we'll go to the next guy. Rising contender Riddick Bowe sought to add further legitimacy to his own resume when he took on former WBA champion. Tony Tubbs. Neither man faced any real trouble, but most observers felt Tubbs earned the victory by landing the cleaner blows. Bo was given a decision and subsequently booed. Tubbs wanted a rematch, but Bo rejected, instead looking ahead to match up against either Holyfield or Tyson. Yet another of the best the 80s had to offer had fallen to Big Daddy Bo. Tubbs would go on to have a few more good wins over Bruce Seldon, Jesse Ferguson, and Tyrell Biggs before hanging up the gloves for good in 2006. Michael Moore looked good again with the extra weight, this time against Levi Billups. Moore gradually overwhelmed Billups, leading into the third. Near the end of said third, Double M unleashed a swift combo that immediately caught the attention of the ref, and the fight was stopped with Billups on his feet. Moore's next fight would prove whether he was a heavyweight to stay or not. In an immediate rematch of their controversial bout, mighty Mike Tyson and Donovan Razor Ruddock engaged in another slugfest that, this time, went the full 12 rounds. Before the bout in regards to Ruddock, Tyson stated, Man, I can't wait to the 28th. I'm gonna make you my girlfriend. And, I'm gonna make sure you kiss me good with those big lips. Though Ruddock did tag Tyson throughout the fight, it was Razor who took the beating of his career as Tyson peppered him on the night. By the end of the fight, Ruddock's jaw was broken and his eyes swollen. What was left of his chin had appeared to be eaten up in this bout as well, for Ruddock never seemed to be able to take a punch too well going forward in his career. With this win, Tyson had all but set in stone the lucrative fight with Evander Holyfield. Or so we thought. After securing his first notable win over Gary Mason, rising contender Lennox the Lion, Lewis, stepped up to the plate against former champion Mike Hercules Weaver. Lewis easily controlled the fight and put Weaver down for the count in the six with his signature right hand. Yet another 80s name on the resume of a rising 90s contender. 
Since moving up to heavyweight after dominating the light heavyweight division, Michael Moore was rolling. Guided by the late, great Emmanuel Stewart, Moore entered the bout against Alex Stewart, ready to increase his stock further in his pursuit of conquering the heavyweight division. Moore got a good taste of what was to come in the ensuing slugfest against Stewart that saw Moore drop Alex three times over the course of the fight. Moore himself was shaken up in the second and recovered well. Ultimately, Double M secured the win by stoppage in the fourth and continued to climb the ranks. For Eddie Futch's 80th birthday, Riddick Bowe gifted his master a first round knockout of the Atlantic City Express, Bruce Selden. Selden, in true form, comically bounced up from the first knockdown, mirroring his missile tendencies, but was floored again by Bo, to which he would fail to answer the count. Bo celebrated in the corner of the ring, motioning to merciless Ray Mercer, who was in the crowd. Would these two lock horns? I sure hope so. Riddick would join Dick Gregory in his battle against Drug shortly after the bout, his motive being how he'd had to grow up around said culture back in Brownsville. Good luck for the newcomer on his road to the heavyweight title scene. Rock Newman would continue his efforts to put together a dream match between Big Daddy Bo and the recently returned Easton assassin, Larry Holmes. I really hope this one happens, but I also wish it could be a prime Holmes against Bo. Here's hoping these fights go through. We'll talk more about Bo and Holmes in the miscellaneous section. Lennox Lewis knocked out former IBF cruiserweight champion Glenn McCrory in just two rounds. Lewis dropped McCrory twice in the second round. It was the second straight ex-champion Lewis that knocked out. Remember, Mike Weaver was WBA heavyweight champ back in the early 80s. Light work for the rising lion, whose time to shine was coming in the next year. In a surprisingly significant undercard bout, Bert Cooper and Joe Hip engaged in an underrated slugfest. Punch after punch, neither man backing down, but Cooper proved to be a notch or two above Hip when he rocked him in the fifth. Then again, maybe referee Joe Cortez stopped the bout too soon, and here's the case for such thoughts. Cooper piled on the punishment and the action was halted with spectators expecting to stand the eight count, but nope. It was stopped. The crowd booed their disagreement given Hip didn't receive the opportunity to respond to Cooper's onslaught. You decide if it was the right choice. This was the fourth straight win for Cooper, all by TKO since having an admirable but losing effort 1990 against the likes of Ray Mercer and Riddick Bowe. His heavyweight journey was back on track and the will to compete above cruiserweight would shockingly result in, just one month later, him being a substitute for a substitute against the former undisputed cruiserweight champ turned heavyweight champ. You couldn't write this. Sports is undefeated in its storylines. All right, let's move on to the main event, in part helmed by a man Cooper went to war with. In January, Ray Mercer captured the WBO title after breaking Francesco Damiani's nose in a knockout win. Tommy, the Duke, Morrison, had been on the rise, building a reputation as a fan favorite with his historical left hook. This was truly the test of courage. It was also a grudge rematch of sorts given Mercer had decision Morrison back in the amateurs of the 88 Olympic trials of which Mercer would go on to capture gold. Morrison started very strong and was taking it to Mercer leading into the fourth round where Mercer took the advantage by tagging back a gassed Morrison. In the fifth, one of the most merciless finishes to a boxing match in the history of the sport was caught on film when Ray Mercer held nothing back in his assault 
of a defenseless Tommy Morrison. Mercer's stock soared and Morrison's took a spike, but the Duke wasn't out of the sweepstakes altogether. In a bizarre affair, up and coming Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, took on veteran Elijah Phoenix Steele Tillery. Bo dominated and dropped Tillery in the first, but all hell would break loose after the bell when Tillery taunted Bo. Bo swung on Tillery. Tillery kicked at Bo, and Bo's manager Rock Newman held Tillery on the ropes as Bo blasted him over. Tillery was disqualified for kicking. Bo was also gaining a reputation as a dirty fighter of sorts. After winning his next three bouts leading into this one, Larry Holmes ended 1991 with a minute and a half stoppage over Jamie Howe. Light work again for the former champion. It was also nine days after Holmes' 42nd birthday. Boxing fans had already been made believers by old George Foreman, and the story appeared to be the same with old Larry. The Eastern assassin appeared to be the real deal in his own right. In fact, he was about to show that he may have been better in the present day than he was in the mid to late 80s. An opportunity would present itself in the form of the very dangerous, merciless Ray Mercer, who was present. Larry said the two were already signed to fight for February of 1992 and assured he was ready for his younger opponent. Surely the bout would be the proving ground for how formidable the 42-year-old truly was, especially considering Mercer was fresh off both the graphic deflowering of Tommy Morrison and the swift shattering of Francesco Damiani. He's before that was the war with Burt Cooper, where Mercer endured a broken jaw to pull out the win. Again, just how formidable could Big Jack hope to be in the best crop of heavyweights since the Golden Age? Would he be thrashed, or would he take Mercer's O? <laughs> Ray Mercer is made for Larry Holmes. I mean, you know, in spite of my old age, I think he's a good fight, the best man will win. On the undercard of the homecoming, Michael Mora returned from the war against Alex Stewart with an easy showing against Bobby Crabtree. Crabtree was unable to answer for round two after being tagged by Mora well enough in the lone round. Also on the undercard of the homecoming, Young Lion Lennox Lewis engaged Tyrell Biggs in a long-awaited rematch. The two were rivals in the Olympics, and 1984 saw Biggs beat out Lewis for the gold medal. This bout was the first time since the 1973 Frazier Foreman bout that Olympic gold medalists faced off. In round three, Lewis knocked Biggs down three times, and the fight was stopped on the third knockdown. This would be Biggs' last notable fight of the 90s as he fizzled out into retirement seven years later in 1998. A pattern of sorts appeared to be emerging amongst two of the heavyweight division's rising young lions. They had Olympic history of their own and appeared to be on an inevitable collision course. Originally, Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson were slated to clash for the Undisputed Championship on November 8th, but Mike had to pull out due to a rib injury. Instead, Holyfield would take on journeyman Burt Cooper after original substitute Francesco Damiani had to pull out due to a sprained ankle. Strangely enough, this bout did not disappoint as Cooper ended up giving Holyfield more than was expected. Holyfield dropped Cooper in the first. Cooper returned the favor in the third for the first knockdown in Evander's career. And Holyfield showed his championship heart when he stormed back in the fifth with a barrage that initially appeared to make Cooper quit, but he would fight on. 
In the seventh, referee Mills Lane stopped the fight when Cooper failed to respond to 24 unanswered blows. Holyfield made very good use of the uppercut in this fight, and Cooper never managed to make the adjustments. His chin seemed to be more than enough to absorb the constant uppercuts, and I've always referred to Burt Cooper as the crimson chin because of its efforts in this bout. The real deal had just retained the WBA and IBF titles. The WBC refused to sanction this fight because they didn't have Cooper ranked. George Foreman returned eight months after his admirable showing against The Real Deal in a three-round stoppage win over Jimmy Ellis. Wait, Jimmy Ellis? The former WBA champion who Joe Frazier squashed over 20 years earlier? Obviously not, but they've got the same name and I can't let that go unsaid. Foreman battered Ellis so profoundly that he had his 15-year junior walking to the wrong corner to end the second. Richard Steele saw enough in the next round. George landed 122 of 173 punches. The commentators acknowledged that Foreman was performing in his career like a man half his age, and I've got to concur, and it ain't just because he was wearing the Rumble in the Jungle shorts. He was still very much a worthwhile contender, and Evander Holyfield just proved to be a notable champion. Foreman's drive and will were not dead, and he was still out to regain the heavyweight title. Could he regain the title, or even get another opportunity at the title for that matter? Stick around and find out. I'm in good, bad shape, but I'm gonna make it. And there's a great Olympian on really both. And I think we're going to draw and have the whole world coming up to see two Olympians fight again. And then uh, if Holyfield is ready, I'll fight him. In a rematch of their circus show two months earlier, Riddick Bowe made light work of Elijah Tillery, stopping him in the fourth round. Bowe continued his march toward heavyweight prominence as Tillery would not fight until 1993, where he had his last bout in a losing effort to James Bone Crusher Smith. At the conclusion of 1991, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield was still the undisputed world champion, but much was brewing in the division. Old and new faces were gearing up to challenge the real deal, and the division would be scrambled in 1992. Upset of the year goes to Ray Mercer in his shocking massacre of high stock contender Tommy Morrison. Mercer's win was the domino effect that derailed Morrison's contention for the major titles. The heavyweights did not receive round of the year, but I'm going with round three of the Holyfield Cooper title bout. Cooper ascended his journeyman status on this night to drop the champion, survived a barrage of his own, and ended the round stunning the champion again. One of the most exciting rounds in the division's history. The winner of Fight of the Year goes to the Tyson Ruddick rematch where Razor was dropped twice and beat the count to engage Tyson in a back and forth slugfest through to the final bell where Tyson was awarded the victory. This fight did well to improve the stock of both men. Our winner for Fighter of the Year goes to Evander Holyfield. The Real Deal had two impressive title defenses against surprisingly game challengers in George Foreman and Burt Cooper. Evander weathered many storms to come out on top. On March 8th, a battle that should have taken place in the 80s went on when Tim Witherspoon beat out Carl Williams by split decision. It was a good fight but fans were noticeably disappointed that there was no knockout. 
In July, Mike Tyson was arrested on accusations of raping Miss Black Rhode Island Desiree Washington. The trial took place from January 26th to February 10th of 1992. On December 24th, Ray Mercer was stripped of the WBO title for signing to fight Larry Holmes and not his mandatory Michael Moorer. Now, what if the impending last stand were for the WBO title? Hmm. Back on the topic of Larry Holmes and Riddick Bow, the fight didn't come to be and both sides have their stories. According to Rock Newman, everyone was saying no to a fight with the rapidly rising Bow. According to Larry Holmes, in an interview many years later, well, the bow camp it. never accepted his challenge. Accepted Who's never telling the truth in this game of he said, she I said? I don't I know. know. You decide. I, I just really I wish these two would fall. Speaking of Big Daddy Bo, he won his other two fights, giving him seven wins on the year. He moved to 28-0, and a shot at the title was looking to be inevitable for Bo heading into 1992. Would it be his year? Overall, 1991 was a very exciting year for the heavyweights that had excitement building toward the title picture and many questions over the division's future. Surely, 1992 would have the answers to all these questions, right? The winner of the undercard of 1991's closer, The Homecoming, was back right away to open 1992. Michael Moore bashed Mike White, nearly scoring a knockout win before White was saved by the final bell in the 10th round. Moore also dropped the giant in the first. Mike White stood at 6 foot 10 and outweighed Moore by 50 pounds. Size matters not. Larry Holmes' last stand. The 42-year-old was against one of the best the 90s had to offer, an undefeated former WBO champion, Ray Mercer, and was a 4-1 to underdog. Mercer had relinquished the title in favor of fighting Holmes over Michael Moore. On the night of the fight, the Eastern assassin shocked the boxing world when he turned back the clock and gave Mercer a boxing lesson. He was beating Ray to the punch, outlanding him, and taking the best that Mercer had to offer while fighting out of the seeming disadvantage of being cornered. Despite being on the back pedal for virtually the entire fight, Holmes was landing as if he were the aggressor. After 12 rounds, Holmes was awarded a unanimous decision win and found himself in the title picture. This was a stunning upset considering the demolition job that was Mercer Morrison. Speaking of which, Holmes taunted Mercer mid-fight, telling him that he wasn't Tommy Morrison. Again, what if this match had been for the WBO title? It looks like Larry would have become heavyweight champ again sooner than expected. On February 10th, Mike Tyson was convicted of the rape of 18-year-old Desiree Washington and was sentenced to serve a six-year prison term with four years probation on March 26th. Any hopes of Tyson engaging in the new crop of heavyweights had been eviscerated, and once again, the match with Holyfield was out of the question. <laughs> Returning from the Mike Tyson duology, which upped his stock despite him losing both affairs, Donovan Razor Ruddick took former WBA champion Greg Page out in eight rounds. It was a good exchange, but 
Ruddick started catching the Defiant page. Still, the smash would be the difference maker as it would make the difference in the 7th and the 8th. Page was so dazed after being saved by the bell to end the 8th that the action was stopped before the ninth could even be considered. Good win over a former champion, one that dropped Mike Tyson in sparring, might I add, that further pumped Ruddock's stock. Is he next in line for the real deal's title? Big George Foreman's comeback continued when he took on Alex the Destroyer Stewart. Foreman was expected to win easily, and the early goings proved as much when Foreman dropped Stewart twice in the second. Foreman even took some time to talk to photographers mid-round, mirroring Larry Holmes talking to cameraman mid-round against Ray Mercer. However, Stewart began to come on harder as George let the fight go on without a quick finish, and it culminated in George taking the worst beating of his career, despite securing the win via majority decision. Another one of the best slugfests the 90s has to offer that saw Alex Stewart win the hearts of the fans with his valiant effort. After thrashing Conroy Nelson in his first fight on the year, Riddick Bowe returned just one month later to tuck away Everett Martin. I mentioned the Conroy Nelson fight because there's no available footage as of this time and Bo put him away in the opening round. Martin had started his career at middleweight but ate his way up to heavyweight and journeyman status. At the end of the third, there were fears of a repeat Elijah Tillery incident, but thankfully the two men didn't escalate the situation. The fight was stopped in the fifth due to a cut on Martin's left eyelid, possibly due to the improper lacing on Bo's right glove. Not a bad win considering Martin had gone the distance with Big George Foreman back in 1989 and it was giving Bo a decent fight before the stoppage. He matched up with Big Daddy and uh, one of us had to go and you knew it wasn't going to be me. As was mentioned, Ray Mercer vacated the WBO title in favor of a fight with Larry Holmes over Michael Moore. Instead of awarding Moore the title, he was required to compete against notable journeyman Burt Cooper. The ensuing bout would come to be known by some as the Inferno Round. Yet another slugfest from the 90s. Cooper dropped Moore early in the first before Moore rose to his feet and returned the favor toward the end of the round. The slugfest continued until the third, where Cooper again dropped Moore. Double M answered the count and bravely fought on in the continuing derby until the decisive fifth round. In the fifth, Moore overwhelmed Cooper to the canvas. He would answer the count, but referee Joe O'Neill stopped the fight at the sight of the battered Cooper. With this win, Double M had become the first ever Southpaw heavyweight champion. If it weren't for the undisputed title fight to come in November, this would have easily been fight of the year, with the first round also capturing round of the year. Moore parted ways with trainer Emmanuel Stewart, who would go on to establish a pattern of his own over the decade. Successful fighters tended to stem from his guidance. Moore, meanwhile, sought out New York trainer Teddy Atlas and embarked on a successful road of his own. School's in session, kids. It's the class of champions. An appropriate billing considering the prestige of both warriors. Undisputed world champion Evander Holyfield met former champion Larry Holmes in a would-be dream fight. If Holmes were in his prime, this would have been one for the ages. Still, Larry put on a good showing in this losing effort to the champion. Larry attempted to bait his way to victory just as he did against Ray Mercer, and he did see some limited success in his corner strategy, but Holyfield still managed to outland and outwork the challenger. Big Jack, as he was nicknamed at the time, was unable to chop down the tree 
that was the real deal. Unfortunately for the Easton Assassin, this would be his last chance at the Undisputed Championship. He was never able to stake his claim to being undisputed, a feat that seemed to elude him over the course of his illustrious career. Four months after decking the Louisville Rage, Razor Ruddick vanquished unbeaten Phil Jackson after two knockdowns, one in the third and another in the fourth that Jackson failed to answer. Of course, the lethal weapon was, once again, the smash. Okay, I'm tired of holding this in. Wouldn't it have been infinitely cooler if Ruddick called the smash the Razor's Edge? No? Just me? Holy shnikes, man. In an IBF title eliminator, Riddick Bo stopped Pierre Kotzer in seven rounds. Bo showed his willingness to brawl against the very game Kotzer and ultimately got the better of his opponent. With this win, Riddick Bo had set himself up for an encounter with the reigning defending undisputed heavyweight champion of the world to be contested in November of that year. The 1992 Olympic boxing scene saw future contenders David Tua, Danell Nicholson, Larry Donald, and Brian Nielsen compete for glory. However, the winner, again, would be a Cuban amateur champion. Felix Savan, considered to be Teofilo Stevenson's successor, would win his first Olympic gold medal at heavyweight when he defeated Nigeria's David Izan. Savan, just as Stevenson before him, refused to leave the amateurs for the pro rankings and a shot at Iron Mike Tyson. Cuba would also take the super heavyweight gold home when Roberto Bellotto defeated Nigeria's Richard Igbinegu. On Halloween night in a heavyweight eliminator, WBC ranked numbers one and two contenders respectively, Razor Ruddick and Lennox Lewis clashed. The winner of this bout was guaranteed a championship match against the winner of the Holyfield Bowl bout in two weeks. Ruddick's efforts against Mike Tyson sent his stock soaring through the roof as he was a two to one betting favorite on this night and the overall favorite to win the four-man heavyweight title tournament. George Foreman said something to the tune of not being able to trust a fighter whose reputation was built on losing efforts. Britain's dream of having their own heavyweight champion had been a century in the making, and it appeared closer than ever when the lion sent Ruddick's stock crashing down with three spooky, monstrous knockdowns. In a stunning upset, Lennox Lewis had just vanquished Razor Ruddick by second round stoppage and proved Big George Foreman's words to be true. Lewis awaited the winner of the undisputed title bout to be contested two weeks later. Michael Moore returned six months after claiming the vacant WBO title in a non-title bout against Bronco, or, I mean Rhino, Billy Wright. Why was the title not on the line? I'm not sure. Moore secured a TKO win over Wright in the second round. Good hand speed for Moore in a freeze frame knockdown. By that, I mean Wright realized how stunned he was a bit after the fact. On the subject of the champion's status, Moore would relinquish the WBO title on February 3rd of the next year to pursue the more prestigious heavyweight titles from the WBC, WBA, and IBF. 
in one of the all-time greatest heavyweight title bouts that sparked the greatest heavyweight trilogy since Ali Frazier, undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world Evander, the real deal, Holyfield, took on undefeated Riddick challenger Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Questions swirled on if Bo could hang against a warrior like Holyfield in the long run, and he answered such questions emphatically as he took it to the champion. Many brawls broke out between the two that saw Bo get the better of Holyfield. Riddick was beating Evander to the punch and rocking him while no-selling Evander's blows. The 10th round of this affair is one of the greatest rounds of all time across any division. Bo uprooted Holyfield with a sharp uppercut that sent the champion staggering toward the ropes, and Big Daddy followed up with a ruthless series of blows that had the boxing world wondering how the real deal was still on his feet. Amazingly, Holyfield not only survived but turned the tables on Bo by wobbling the challenger and sparking another brawl that would go on till round's end. The two gladiators embraced one another with taps to the body at the sound of the bell. Not only was Bo shutting down any doubters, but so was Holyfield, whose reign had been looked down on since he'd never beaten Mike Tyson and had taken on questionable opposition. In the 11th, Bo dropped Holyfield after slipping under the champion and decking him to the side or back, depending on who you ask, of the head. Holyfield answered the count and survived the round. The back and forth slugfest continued until the end of the fight, where Riddick, big Daddy Bo would be crowned the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Both men had proven themselves and earned the adoration of the boxing public. There's no question that this was Bo at his apex, but I personally argue that this was also Holyfield at his absolute best. Bo was just that damn good at the time. In the ensuing celebration that followed the bout, Riddick crossed paths with his mandatory challenger, Lennox Lewis. The two had history dating back to the 1988 Super Heavyweight Olympic Finals, where Lewis got the better of Bo in a questionable stoppage. They exchanged words and swore they would vanquish one another in their coming battle for the right undisputed to fight title. Riddick Bowe for the heavyweight championship of the world. I thought it was a good, solid performance by Riddick Bowe. I think that Evander Holyfield was a great champion, and he went out like a champion, and his reign as a champion was great as well. Lewis, he's looking to sidestep Lennox Lewis, but let's hope he doesn't. Let's hope I don't have to call him Chicken Bowe. He was saying, basically, he ain't afraid of me, and he'll fight me any day. And I said, I'm going to knock you out the same way I knocked you out in the Olympics. Closing the door on 1992, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Riddick Bowe was the new unified lineal WBA IBF champion. He was no longer undisputed because he was stripped by the WBC for refusing to fight mandatory challenger Lennox Lewis. Bo's publicity stunt to trash the belt worked initially, but has significantly backfired for his reputation over time. The Bo and Lewis camps could not reach a deal to hold the fight, and unification was severed again. Upset of the year goes to the Easton Assassin's boxing lesson. He turned back the clock and bested Ray Mercer en route to a title bout. Ring Magazine's round of the year went to round 10 of the Holyfield Bowl title bout. That round stands tall to this day as arguably the greatest round in heavyweight history. Likewise, the Ring's fight of the year was the undisputed title fight, 
between undefeated champion and challenger, respectively, Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe. Big Daddy put the division on notice with his win over the real deal. In a clean sweep of the awards, Riddick Big Daddy Bo was given the honor of Fighter of the Year. Bo's willingness to go to war won over the boxing public. He had arguably the best jab in the division, he could fight on the inside and the outside, had one of the best chins, and had charisma oozing from his super heavyweight stature. It appeared that Bo would reign for a long time to come. On February 7th, soon to be contender in 1988 Olympic super heavyweight bronze medalist Andrew Galata made his professional debut after winning bronze at the 88 Olympics. 1992 was a busy year for 80s veteran and former champion Greg Page. He was stopped by a rebounding Razor Ruddick, beat Bone Crusher Smith, and lost to Francesco Damiani. His last notable bouts came against Tim Witherspoon and Jorge Luis Gonzalez in 1999 before his untimely death in 2001 after a bout against Dale Crow. May the fallen champion rest in peace. On November 14th, former champion Pinklin Thomas won the inaugural IBO and WBF titles in a win over Craig Payne. Thomas would retire in January of the next year after dropping the WBF title. Ray Mercer hopped on the comeback trail eight months after the Holmes loss and won his two fights. The opportunity for a dream bout would come in February if Mercer could win said bout. Before vanquishing Razor Ruddick and permanently moving into the heavyweight main event, Lennox Lewis won his other three fights on the year, two by TKO and the other by decision. Michael Moore won his other three fights in 1992 and continued making quite the name for himself as a heavyweight. His resume technically now read heavyweight champion. Again, the extra weight looks good on you, champ. David Tua made his debut on December 1st in a first round knockout. Over the next five years, he stopped all but four of his opponents before engaging in a CompuBox record setting bout against the president. I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll get to that. Unfortunately for boxing fans, the once destined crossroads between Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis had been averted. The Olympic controversy, the patterned career path toward contention, the failed negotiations, all had been for naught as the biggest super fight of the 90s up to that point was lost. Overall, 1992 was a stellar year for the division that once again saw both old and young faces duke their way closer to the mountaintop. A changing of the guard had come with the arrival of Bo and Lewis and the fall of Holyfield. Mike Tyson was locked up. Foreman and Holmes proved to still be formidable. Just what was to come in 1993? Could Bo and Lewis reach an agreement after all? The boxing world anxiously awaited. History was made on January 14th to open the year as the WBC gave Lennox Lewis their title. He was the first British heavyweight champion since Bob Fitzsimmons in 1899, breaking an almost century-long dry spell. Still, because it was awarded and not won in battle, there was a technical shadow over Lewis casted by Riddick Bowe. 
On the undercard of Heavy Damage, Tommy Morrison looked to add the name of Carl the Truth Williams to his resume. Morrison was banging away at Williams up until the fifth where the Truth dropped Morrison with a stiff duo of rights. Morrison rose and was dropped again almost instantly. He would again beat the count and take the best Williams had to offer until taking back the momentum leading into the ninth where he stopped Williams on the ropes. A solid comeback win for the Duke. In the main event, Big George Foreman stopped Pierre Kutzer, knocking him down in the fourth and eighth rounds before referee Joe Cortez called a halt to the action. Foreman was proving that he was still a force to be reckoned with. In an event promoted as The Homecoming, the heavyweight title scene saw some engineering. Ray Mercer was matched up against Jesse Ferguson with the winner slated to get champion Riddick Bowe later in the year. Against the agenda, the boogeyman managed to outbox Mercer en route to a unanimous decision win, throwing the planned Bowe Mercer matchup to oblivion. There were allegations that Mercer attempted to bribe Ferguson for the win mid fight, but Mercer was cleared in the court case. Mercer and Ferguson would have a rematch on November 19th of that same year that would see Mercer avenge the loss in a controversial split decision win. Some felt that the boogeyman had beaten Mercer again and simply had his number. A pattern of sorts was emerging in which Merciless Ray appeared to struggle with 80s heavyweights while excelling against the 90s crop. So, there went Bo versus Mercer, a match that sadly never came to be. The two were roommates back in their Olympic days, and Mercer has said he used to beat up on Bo in sparring, one of which was a birthday bash. This is coming from a man who had a reputation as a sparring warrior and an all-around danger in his amateur day peak. And again, Bo was also a gym warrior. Who would have won the pro bout? It'll be addressed in a what if down the line here on Boxingpedia. In the main event, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo made light work of the faded ex-champion Michael Dokes, stopping him in the first round. Bo took a shot at Dokes despite the challenger already being down to one knee. The dirty reputation was growing. Dokes beat the count and rose to a beating from Bo. The referee stopped the fight near the end of the first as Bo battered Dokes. Dokes in his corner felt the stoppage was premature. On February 8th, Michael Moore vacated the WBO title so that he could be ranked by the three major sanctioning bodies. He got back to work against prominent 80s heavyweight and former champion James Bone Crusher Smith. Moore coasted to a unanimous decision win and looked forward to challenging for the heavyweight title. Along building some stellar momentum in or out to 1994, Oliver McCall retired former WBO champion Francesco Damiani in eight rounds. A right hand made Damiani walk away from the action, signaling he'd had enough. It was his last fight, and despite three wins before this that came after the Mercer loss, Damiani never regained form. Still, only two losses and the WBO title on his resume sounds like a good enough career to me. Being the inaugural champ will always belong to his legacy. Star Spangled Glory Tony Tucker acted as a measuring stick of sorts for heavyweight greatness dating back to his war with Mike Tyson in the 80s. After being declared the new WBC champion after Riddick Bowe dumped the belt, Lewis faced off against a game Tucker who was seeking his second world title in a great display, dropping Tucker twice in the third and ninth rounds on his way to a unanimous decision win. Despite this effort against a former champion, 
Lewis still remained in the shadow of the unified champion, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Riddick Bowl settled for Jesse Ferguson after Ray Mercer whiffed on the opportunity. In the heavyweight debate, Cinderella challenger Jesse Ferguson challenged undefeated unified champion Riddick Bowe. The IBF did not have the boogeyman ranked and refused to allow the title to be defended against him. At the end of the first, Bowe dropped Ferguson with a stiff left and followed with a right as the boogeyman was already down. He would beat the count and survive the round only to be stopped by a vicious combination from both seconds into the second round. It was another easy defense for heavyweight world champion, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Star Spangled Battle. Glory or battle, take your pick. Anyway, George Foreman and Tommy Morrison met to determine the winner of the vacant WBO title. Champion Riddick Bowe was on commentary for the bout. Morrison took the boxer's approach to Foreman, tagging him from the outside and picking his spots carefully. Ultimately, he won a unanimous decision and captured the title. Was it all over for Big George's comeback journey? That's another loss now for the heavyweight crown, or at least a portion of it. If he had won, and if he manages to capture the IBF title before 1995, Foreman would have became the first man to win all four title belts. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise. If Foreman had won the then less prestigious WBO title, would it really have counted? Yes, of course. But would it really have? You decide. The rematch known as Only the Strong Survive saw Evander Holyfield hit the scene on his road back to the title. He lost to Big Daddy Bo. Holyfield and Stewart had engaged in a memorable, bloody war back in 1989, and the same was expected here. It wound up being a unanimous decision win for Holyfield that saw some bright spots of action. Holyfield looked to match up with Bo again later in the year. Jeepers creepers, do we have a bizarre one on deck. Originally, Tommy Morrison was scheduled to fight Mike Williams, but Williams refused to leave his dressing room. Him, the Doughboy Tomashek, came out of the crowd as a late split-second substitute. To clarify, this was no average Joe, as some believe. The man was a professional boxer in his own right. Despite this, he was full of snacks and beer from his day spectating, and it showed in his fighting style and antics. He put on a decent showing despite the announcers talking him down and the crowd booing. Tomashek had a Cinderella opportunity before him, but this ain't no Rocky movie. After, perhaps, carrying Tomashek the duration of the fight, Morrison dropped Tim in the fourth. He rose, and the bell sounded. The ringside doctor stopped the fight before the fifth round could begin, despite protests. What do you think? Tomashek was bloody, sure, but was he really unfit to continue? Were they all saving face? Was it lose-lose for the Duke? You decide. It was Morrison's first defense of the WBO strap. The focus, anyway, was the hype building around Tommy's impending bout with Lennox Lewis. Jeepers. Creepers.
In the first ever heavyweight title bout in which two British-born fighters contended for the heavyweight championship, WBC champion Lennox, the Lion Lewis, took on challenger Big Bounce Back Frank Bruno in the Battle of Britain. The build-up to the fight saw the two gun for one another's neck. Bruno insisted that Lewis was not British for fighting under the Canadian banner in the Olympics and asserted that he was a paper champion. He also claimed that no one in Britain cared about Lennox. Lewis, on the other hand, countered by stating how following his mother to Canada was out of his power and that Bruno was an Uncle Tom. He also ribbed Bruno for how he made a fool of himself by dressing up in girls' clothing. The bad blood was real between the two, despite the claims that it was only about boxing at the end of the day. When the two met in Wales, there was no love lost. Bruno took the boxer's approach and looked to nullify the monster right hand from Lewis. For the most part, he was successful, and the fight was even up until the decisive seventh. Bruno hadn't planned for Lewis's backup, the left hook. After taking a combination of short lefts and rights, Lewis exploded with a left hook that Bruno never recovered from, and he battered Frank for the remainder of the round until referee Mickey Van stopped the fight as Bruno lay defenseless on the ropes. This win did well to open public opinion to the positive for champion Lennox Lewis in his home country, but to many, he was still in the shadow of opposing champion Riddick Big Daddy Bo. A bout was set for December between champions Tommy Morrison and Lennox Lewis. This defense was to be Morrison's tune-up and was a mere formality. In a shocker, Morrison was the one who was made easy work of in the Tulsa shootout, as he was dropped three times until the fight was stopped by referee Danny Campbell. Michael Bent was a betting underdog who would go on to drop the title to Herbie Hyde the next year, while Morrison had once again suffered a career derailing loss. How much longer could Tommy go partying hard as a prize fighter? His clout was fading, but not snuffed out. Tommy Morrison beat Tommy Morrison tonight. I stayed in the middle a little bit uh, too long and got caught with some good shots. Any man over 200 pounds can hurt you. So. On the undercard of Bo Holyfield 2, rising heavyweight Jorge Luis Gonzalez stopped former Larry Holmes challenger Ronaldo Snipes in the 10th and final round. As Snipes' eyes closed over the bout, Gonzalez grew more confident or perhaps even arrogant. In the 8th, it was most apparent with Snipes' growing more aggressive with wild hooks and the Cuban giant responding by taunting his smaller foe with cries of Sinistra e ancora destro di Gonzalez. Jorge was fighting with his hands down and in complete control. The wind notched him to 17-0, none of his fights seeing the final bell. We'll check in on Gonzalez in two years' time when he makes his first true step up in competition in an explosive affair against a former amateur rival. We'll see if he's for real. Repeat or revenge, friends or enemies, Bo or Holyfield. The rematch of the 1992 Fight of the Year was on and Holyfield had the opportunity to become the third man to regain the heavyweight title from the man who'd beaten him for it after Floyd Patterson and Muhammad Ali. The real deal came in with a new all-around approach and plan now trained by the legendary Emmanuel Stewart. 
Rather than brawl with Bo head on as he did the first time, Holyfield would take a more disciplined approach to Bo and box him. Bo came into the fight 10 pounds heavier than their last fight and didn't look to be as sharp as he was before. The two men fought a very even fight leading to the fan man incident in round seven that sent the event into disarray. Bo's entourage made quick work of the fan man. Bo's wife passed out and the round would resume 21 minutes later. This break in the action may have ultimately cost Bo, though it did secure him the rest that observers felt he needed. Round eight would see Holyfield dominate the champion leading Bo to become very aggressive for the remainder of the fight. Despite this, Holyfield finished the remaining round strong, and the final round saw the slugfest return between the two until the final bell. Evander Holyfield was announced the winner by majority decision and the new unified lineal WBA and IBF heavyweight champion. Bo was gracious and humble in defeat. James Miller, the fan man, spent some time in the hospital before paying $200 to get off on bail for his actions. The incident won event of the year from Ring Magazine. Following the bout, Holyfield's team was unable to come to an agreement in retaining the services of Emmanuel Stewart, and they went their separate ways. The real deal also looked to have a unification bout with WBC champion Lennox Lewis, but the WBA and IBF threatened to strip him of the titles if he didn't face their mandatory Michael Moorer. Bo's camp also offered for a third fight, but again, Holyfield was warned by the WBA and IBF that he would be stripped if he accepted the offer. It's almost as if the sanctioning bodies didn't want unification. I shall return. How much shock everybody? He better know the feminine predicament he was at one point. I'm just as much uh, determined as he was the last time. Okay, I'm just still young and I'll be back. To round off 1993, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield had once again climbed the heavyweight mountain and was the reigning unified, lineal WBA and IBF champion. Holyfield's initial contemplation of retirement was short-lived as he geared up to defend his crown in 1994. Our upset of the year has to go to the Boogeyman and his efforts over merciless Ray Mercer. This upset destroyed the dream match between Bo and Mercer. Michael Bench shocker over Tommy Morrison is a close second. Round of the year goes to the fifth round of Morrison Williams where the truth almost secured the win by three round stoppage. But Morrison showed tremendous heart and survived the round to go on and win the fight by stoppage. Our fight of the year is the very even Bo Holyfield rematch that also saw the fan man incident. These two were forming the best heavyweight rivalry since Ali Frazier. Louis Bruno is a close second with Louis's impressive comeback victory. The fighter of the year is the lion, Lennox Lewis. His impressive defenses of the WBC title over Tony Tucker and Frank Bruno made waves across the division, especially considering the dethroning of Riddick Bowe at the hands of Evander Holyfield. On January 28th, middleweight Olympic silver medalist Chris Bird made his professional debut, turned heavyweight three fights into his career, and would build an undefeated record. On February 27th in China, Mike Hercules Weaver beat Schmoke and Burt Cooper by unanimous decision. Weaver would go on to fight until 2000 where he would have his last match in a rematch against Larry Holmes where he was stopped in six rounds. 
He was stopped by Holmes in 12 rounds back in 1979. And again, I feel obliged to say that they're overdue a rematch considering they love fighting 21 years apart. Randall Tex Cobb at his last bout in June, winning by stoppage. Jesse the Boogeyman Ferguson would fight until 1999, facing names such as Frank Bruno, Larry Holmes, Alex Stewart, Haseem Rockman, and Andrew Galata. Ferguson had a layered career, dating back to 1983. Larry Holmes hopped on the comeback trail and won all five of his bouts. One of those wins came over Jose Ribalta, an 80s bred bout that took place in the 90s. Larry was for real when he said he was coming for those belts and he wouldn't stop. Ray Mercer had his 1993 opened and closed by the Boogeyman with the two splitting wins, albeit controversially. Mercer won his two intermediate bouts between the Ferguson fights. Michael Moore won his other three fights on the year and would head into 1994 looking to complete the story of the weight class move up by becoming a light heavyweight champion who ascended to the heavyweight crown. Could he do it? We'll see. Riddick, Big Daddy Bo faced an unexpected setback with the loss to Holyfield and would enter a dark phase of his career as he struggled to gain a shot at the titles he'd lost. Overall, 1993 was a reversal of fortune for the division. Morrison's bounce back was derailed almost instantly. Iced out Lewis was now the WBC champion and Holyfield had regained the titles from Bo. Michael Moore's opportunity to shine was on the horizon as he was the mandatory for Holyfield heading in to 1994. To open the year, Herbie Hyde dethroned Michael Bent for the WBO title after dropping him in the third and seventh rounds. The referee stopped the bout after the seventh round knockdown. The two had also come to blows at a press conference before their fight. I guess that explains Bent that trying Michael to bite Bent a chunk out of Hyde's shoulder at the end of the exactly sixth. Right. The fight would be the end of Bent's career with him going into a coma for four days and nearly dying after collapsing in his dressing room after the fight from a brain injury. Bent retired after making a successful recovery. The now Teddy Atlas helmed Michael Moore finally got his shot for the major world titles when he challenged unified champion Evander Holyfield. Moore was putting on a good enough showing until Holyfield dropped Moore with a left hook in the second round. Despite this, one of the judges scored the round even instead of for Holyfield. Moore answered the count and continued an even affair with Evander. Between rounds, Teddy Atlas laid into Moore, insisting that he wasn't doing enough for the win. This lit a fire in Moore that led him to take the initiative in the fight all the way to the final bell. He was the new unified lineal WBA IBF heavyweight world champion. Unfortunately for the ex-champion, Evander Holyfield would be forced into retirement due to apparent heart problems. Originally, there were talks of a unification bout between Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield, but Holyfield was unsure regarding his career continuing after avenging his loss to Riddick Bowe. That and the loss to Moore derailed any chances of a Holyfield-Lewis matchup. Moore also instead chose to face Big George Foreman over unifying the division against Lennox Lewis. 
So, Lewis focused on the man in front of him, Bill Jackson. The Lion dominated the match from the opening bell. He dropped Jackson four times en route to a stoppage win in the eighth. With Holyfield and Bo both sporting recent losses, Holyfield, Bo, and Moorer seemingly avoiding opportunities to face Lewis and Lewis embarking on a dominant reign as champion, the imposing shadow that once dominated his public perception was waning. Lennox Lewis, begrudgingly, was finally emerging as the world's best heavyweight in the eyes of the boxing world. After Riddick Big Daddy Bo's camp managed to outbid Michael Moore's camp in the Lennox Lewis sweepstakes, at least according to Rock Newman, it appeared that the Olympic Super Heavyweight rematch was finally on, albeit at the cost of the unification of the division. On June 18th, the two were signed to fight for the WBC title, the same title Bo trashed, with the condition that Lewis defend his title against impending challenger, Oliver McCall. The ironclad guaranteed super fight would then take place in either November, December, or March of the next year. Reports differ across the news. In his first bout since dropping the titles to the real deal, Riddick Bowe took on undefeated prospect Buster Mathis Jr. in an event billed as Raging Bowe. It was a wild journey getting to this point. Bowe was originally scheduled to fight Francois Botha, but suffered a cut in training and the bout was canceled. The matchup with Buster was delayed twice due to Bowe suffering a back injury in training before finally taking place on August 13th. Riddick took care of business easily over the three rounds and dropped Mathis to one knee in the fourth. Despite this, Bo took another shot that knocked Mathis unconscious and the bout was ruled a no contest. Not a disqualification loss for Bo, but a no contest. Despite the controversy, Bo's planned match against Lennox Lewis scheduled for the next year was still a go. The now Emmanuel Stewart tuned and trained Oliver McCall stepped up to challenge WBC world champion Lennox Lewis. The Atomic Bull wasn't expected to do much against the champion as the world looked forward to the super fight against Bo. Oliver McCall shut down everything with a grand upset when he stopped Lennox in the second round after a sharp counter right connected with the champ. Lewis answered the count, but the referee waved off the fight as Lewis was on spaghetti legs. The Atomic Bull was the new WBC heavyweight champion, and Lennox Lewis found himself in the same fire as would-be rivals Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe. After the shocking loss, Lewis humbled himself and approached Emmanuel Stewart to be his trainer. Stewart had already expressed interest in Lewis, and this match made in heaven would go on to last until Lewis's retirement. That was the good that came of this. The bad was that Lewis had whiffed on the super fight with Riddick Bowe with the crushing loss. The division's landscape was opening up. One for the ages. More than anything in the world did George Foreman want to fight Michael Moorer for the heavyweight title. It had been 20 years since the grand upset in the rumble in the jungle, 
and George Foreman knew this was his last opportunity to banish the dark cloud that was Zaire. The build-up saw Moore embrace being the mean champion that the media thought him to be. Foreman was undoubtedly the hero, an image that Moore's camp insisted was the work of a fake con artist. According to Foreman, he had this fight mapped out and it all went according to plan, a decree that Michael Moore still claims is Bullshit. to this day. Oh, on fight night, in this, in George came in I'm wearing the exact same like trunks I'm he'd worn Ali. in the upset loss to Ali 20 years earlier. Angelo Dundee, Muhammad oh, Ali's oh. legendary trainer, was also in Foreman's corner. The crowd the was firmly defeated. behind Turn Big George, becoming Get more so as the fight went on and more dominated the ex-champion. Now, Michael. what of the mapped out plan Foreman swore on? Jim Lampley co-signed that Foreman told him he'd get Moore to stand in front of him later in the fight and deliver the hammer. Remember the rope-a-dope? George had one of his own. Turns out that throughout the fight, George was pulling his punches to get Moore to think he'd lost his legendary power. George also continued to use his jab and a hook to the body to place Moore into his ideal positioning. Teddy Atlas noticed what Foreman was doing and repeatedly warned Moore to stay out of the pocket, goes, but Moore refused to comply. In the 10th round, Foreman's plan reached fruition when he knocked the champion out with a stiff right hand that broke Moore's mouthpiece and busted his lip. Moore was counted out and remained dazed on the canvas even after the conclusion as George looked to the heavens to thank God Almighty. George Foreman had done the impossible. The ghost of Zaire was finally and firmly laid to rest. Big George Foreman had become the oldest champion in history up to that point. He was the new unified lineal WBA IBF heavyweight champion of the world. It was a record breaking performance for the now two time champion. Eight years older than Jersey Joe was, the first to win the title 20 years after losing it, and the first to beat an opponent 19 years his junior. The heavyweight division was the widest open it had ever been. We could wind up seeing George and Larry Holmes. You know, remember, Larry's fighting Oliver McCall. Oh, and before we move on, at the end of the Rumble in the Jungle in 1974, I recommended the Ali movie starring Will Smith. Well... Over 20 years later from that movie's release, Big George's story is currently on the big screen and I'll be going to see Everybody it very so soon myself. Well earned, because in my opinion at least, George Foreman's uh, story is right up there with Muhammad Ali's. Congratulations to you, champ. We champion love you, George. In what was an otherwise uneventful win for Big Daddy Bo, the pre-fight turned out to be the more exciting affair, and yet another blow to Bo's reputation, he allowed himself to lose his temper and strike Donald with a stiff one-two combo. I'm talking like a, like a two-piece in a biscuit here, folks. What's worse is that it doesn't seem Donald said anything disrespectful Bo claims he warned Donald to stop talking trash, promising to pop him if he didn't. Perhaps the former champion was in a very dark place at the time. On fight night, Bo squared Donald away with a unanimous decision victory. One more thing before we move on here too. I've got to commend Mr. Larry Donald for taking that one two the way he did. Stayed up on his feet.
At the end of 1994, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. George Foreman was the unified, lineal, WBA, IBF, world heavyweight champion after upsetting the upsetter. Oliver McCall was the new WBC champion after his own upset over dominant champion Lennox Lewis. Is it even a question that George Foreman's win over Michael Moore is upset of the year? The storyline was perfect and only grows in legend as time goes on. If it weren't for this, Oliver McCall's win over Lennox Lewis would have taken the cake. The round of the year goes to the fifth round of the Holyfield Moore title bout in which Michael Moore dominated the champ after an even start, having been propelled by his trainer. Teddy Atlas. Fight of the year goes to Michael Moore's upset of Evander Holyfield. It was an evenly contested affair that saw Double M take the initiative and take it to the champion for the victory, effectively banishing the real deal into retirement. Without a doubt, the fighter of the year is Big George Foreman. Foreman had crafted the greatest sports comeback of all time and could have retired right then and there. Even Muhammad Ali was all for the champion. On February 24th, the boxing world lost the legendary Jersey Joe Walcott. Walcott, before Foreman, was the oldest man to hold the heavyweight title at the age of 37 and was formidable for many years as a top contender with his unique style. Originally, on October 22nd, Tommy Morrison and Herbie Hyde were supposed to fight for the WBO title on a WBO IBF Supercard event billed as High Noon in Hong Kong, but the event was canceled after financial woes. The event would have also saw Frank Bruno take on merciless Ray Mercer in the Hong Kong Stadium. Man, we missed out here. Larry Holmes won his two bouts on the year, one of which was against Jesse the Boogeyman Ferguson. The comeback trail roared on and would pay off in 1995 in the form of another title bout. Could he join the list of heavyweights to regain the heavyweight championship? We'll see very soon. Ray Mercer had one fight in 1994, a draw with Marion Wilson. In 1995, he'd also have one fight, this time against one of the top fighters of the decade, making his grand return. On August 17th, former heavyweight champion Jack Sharkey passed away. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame the same year. Sharky, like many legends of the sport I touch on, will be covered one way or another down the line here on Boxingpedia. The same goes for Jersey Joe, who was mentioned earlier. You're in for some treats if you don't know much about him. On October 13th, Ike Ibeabuchi made his debut with a second round knockout. We'll check back in with the president in his CompuBox record-breaking war against the Tuominator. I won't be covering his career here in detail, but know we're going to cover him in full down the line. A 20-fight career that left many questions we'll sadly never have the answers to. After his victory over Michael Moore, George Foreman now looked to have a super fight against the soon-to-return Mike Tyson. But the WBA insisted he fight Tony Tucker. Foreman refused any dealings with Don King and rejected the fight by vacating the WBA title. Overall, 1994 proved to be the year of upsets. Moore over Holyfield, McCall over Lewis, then Foreman over Moore. The division was in a state 
in which it seemed anyone could contend to be the champion. Holyfield was out of the game, Bo and Lewis were on the rise again, and their super fight had been thrown to oblivion again. However, a familiar face was soon to return and evoke a similar streak of domination, mystique, and excitement over the division as he'd done in the 1980s. On March 4th, the WBA stripped George Foreman for refusing to fight mandatory challenger Tony TNT Tucker. A bout was then scheduled for the vacant title to be contested April 8th on the undercard of Burden of Proof. In his first defense as WBO champion, Herbie Hyde welcomed the challenge of former undisputed champion Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. The fight was a slugfest that saw Hyde shake Bo up in the third, only to be dropped three times in the round by Big Daddy. The slugfest continued in the fourth, with Bo slipping to the canvas after a wide left hook before rising and dropping Hyde twice more. Hyde continued to show great heart as he again staggered Bo in the fifth. He was dropped again in the sixth, and a towel was thrown into the ring, but the fight continued. Bo ultimately got the better of Hyde after dropping him a final time in the sixth, as Hyde took the count on one knee. With this win, Bo became the first heavyweight to hold all four major world titles at one point or another. It was also noted by commentators that Bo was no longer building his technical in-ring ability, instead opting to slug it out in his fights. On the undercard of Burden of Proof, Bruce Seldon captured the vacant WBA title with a seven-round stoppage over former champion Tony Tucker. After his victory, Seldon was appalled that anyone could put an asterisk on his triumph. His second defense would prove if he would keep the same energy. After dethroning the Lion, Oliver McCall rejected an immediate rematch in favor of a bout with the Easton assassin, Larry Holmes. If Holmes were to win this fight, it would add further spark to the subtle rivalry between he and George Foreman being that both would be 45-year-old record-breaking champs. The fight was an even affair that saw Holmes continue proving his ability in advanced age. Be that as it may, McCall still managed to edge Holmes out and retain the title, dominating the fight from the ninth round onward. Whoa, Oliver McCall just beat two of my heavyweight Holy Trinity back-to-back -back in title bouts. That's no easy feat. The Atomic Bull was no joke. This would be the last notable championship bid for the great Larry Holmes. He had unsuccessfully attempted to regain the title four times since originally losing the title and the rematch to Michael Spinks in 1985 and 1986 respectively. Holmes had challenged for the undisputed title twice and lost to Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield, respectively. He would challenge for the IBO title in 1997 to a losing effort against Brian Nielsen and retire five years later in 2002. Larry was also never able to secure the highly desired bout against George Foreman. It almost happened in 1999, but a financial issue derailed the event and it never came to be. Holmes finished his career with a record of 69 wins, six losses, and no draws. The big black cloud had nothing left to prove. 
George Foreman's celebration saw him defend the lineage and the IBF title against the relatively unknown challenger Axel Scholes. Scholes fought a good match from the outside initially until he was cut by George in the fourth and staggered in the fifth. Scholes continued on head to head with Foreman for the remainder of the fight and, despite his efforts, was not given the decision. George won a controversial majority decision and retained his titles. If Scholes had been given the decision, he would have become only the second German to secure the heavyweight crown, or at least a portion of it. Do you believe that ultimately the fight with Mike Tyson will be made? Mike Tyson would have to come to HBO or TVKO, that's all there is to it, if he's ever going to fight me. On the comeback trail, Lennox Lewis returned with a statement win over Lionel Butler. Lewis scored a TKO win over Butler in the fifth after an earlier knockdown in the same round. Butler was on a hot streak, not including a no contest, of 16 wins with 15 coming by knockout. One of these was a first round knockout of former champion Tony Tubbs. Lennox abolished Butler's time as a world level heavyweight in what was his first fight under the guidance of the legendary Emmanuel Stewart. Butler never recovered. Also, does anyone else notice any differences with Lennox? As in, he looks more fine-tuned and not over-reliant on his monstrous right hand? The Manny Stewart effect was real. One more thing. Lewis got back on track in this fashion against the man Riddick Bowe debuted against. Just some food for thought. The future was looking bright for the new Lennox Lewis. The Warrior returns. That's right, Evander Holyfield returned to the sweet science after it was found that his heart problems weren't as serious as initially thought. Holyfield chose to start his comeback against former WBO champion, merciless Ray Mercer. The fight saw the real deal overcome a bad cut to win a unanimous decision over Mercer becoming the first man to drop Mercer along the way. Great start for the returning Evander Holyfield. The IBF ordered an immediate rematch between champion George Foreman and challenger Axel Scholes after the controversial decision. Big George instead chose to vacate the title. With this event, the heavyweight championship was truly splintered with all four alphabet titles and the lineage belonging to different men or no one at all. Tommy Morrison was back in action against former high ranked contender Razor Ruddock in a contest of raw power. The vacant IBC title was up for grabs and the two former high-ranked contenders were looking to make some noise on their trail back to contention. Ruddick started strong by dropping Tommy in the first, to which Morrison answered the count. The Duke returned the favor in the second round. The two traded power punches leading into the fifth, where Ruddick had Morrison in trouble. This continued into the sixth, where Ruddick had Tommy on the edge of going down before missing an uppercut and being floored by Morrison's left hook. He answered the count, but was met by a barrage that led to another standing eight count. Another unanswered barrage saw the action come to a halt. Tommy Morrison had scored a big win on his way back to contention. Justifiably promoted as mortal enemies, Riddick Bowe defended his WBO title against amateur conqueror Jorge Luis Gonzalez. Gonzalez had defeated both Bowe and Lennox Lewis 
in the amateur ranks. Following testy press conferences, the professional bout would be a different result entirely as Bo battered Gonzalez at will. At the conclusion of the fourth, despite the bell sounding off, Bo unwisely risked disqualification by launching an intentional barrage at an almost helpless Gonzalez. Again, the dirty reputation boomed. Bo continued to pound away at Gonzalez until stopping him in the sixth with his signature overhand right. Gonzalez was out cold, and Riddick Bo had secured his revenge in bad blood. The Lion was back, this time against Australian challenger Justin Fortune. Fortune's style was reminiscent of Mike Tyson's, perhaps a deliberate choice by Manny Stewart for the path of his lion? You decide. Lewis finished his 5-9 opponent in the fourth after a series of uppercuts prompted the stoppage before Fortune could even hit the canvas on his way down. The Emmanuel Stewart version of Lennox was looking mighty fine, but his first true test would come three short months later. A heavyweight world title bout on the undercard of an event helmed by a non-title bout. Sounds like the perfect fusion of Mike Tyson's mystique and draw power with the embarrassment and corruption the WBA has sadly become known for. Bruce Seldon defended his WBA title by 10th round stoppage, referee Richard Steele stepping in after having seen enough. No knockdowns, nothing crazy in light of the main event. Yep, Bruce Seldon was already firmly in the shadow of Iron Mike. Maybe they'll meet soon and Seldon can try to escape said shadow. In the aptly titled, He's Back, former undisputed champion Mike Tyson made his return to the sport against Hurricane Peter McNeely. The bout's billing reminds me of the Tyson-Douglas billing, it's self-titled Tyson is Back. Tyson was released from prison on March 25th and got to work on returning to boxing form. McNeely was fired up and determined to make some real noise against Tyson. He came out smoking, but was immediately dropped by Tyson. McNeely rose to his feet and engaged in a wild showing with Tyson. Iron Mike looked sloppy, despite his eventual flooring of McNeely for the disqualification win. Peter was disqualified because his cornerman entered the ring before the bout was called off. Mike looked ahead to winning back the heavyweight title. But before we move on, was there a time traveler at this fight? That looked awfully like a smartphone, right? Wrong. It was just a contemporary camcorder. Myth debunked, but then again, it's cooler to think there is a time traveler, so... I don't know. Think what you will, people. The Empire Strikes Back saw WBC champion Oliver McCall defend his title against Britain's people's champion, Big Bounce Back Frank Bruno. Bruno outboxed McCall for the majority of the fight as the champion waited too long to let his hands fly. When he did, he had the challenger in trouble, but Bruno used his experience to survive the edge of defeat and it was awarded the decision and the title. Despite Lewis having been the first British champion in a century, Bruno became the first to win the title in the ring from a champion, bringing the title back to England. Bruno was also the first British-born fighter to win the heavyweight title on British soil. Laying it all on the line. Such was the case for the contestants who both needed the win. The long time coming bout between Lennox Lewis and Tommy Morrison finally reached fruition. 
Lewis dropped Morrison four times along the way of dominating the fight, winning by stoppage in the sixth. Lennox Lewis was looking brilliant in his comeback since the surprise at the hands of Oliver McCall, having clearly evolved under the tutelage of Emmanuel Stewart. Morrison would fight only once more in the 90s before being forced to hang up the gloves after testing positive for HIV. His lifestyle had caught up to him to devastating effect and result. Despite still reigning as WBO champion, Riddick Bowe's title would not be on the line against his rival on the comeback, Evander Holyfield. Despite being diagnosed with hepatitis A, Holyfield elected to fight Bowe anyway. The two had become such good friends that they were interviewed sitting side by side with no worry of tension boiling over. I can't find the footage to this as it seems to have disappeared entirely from the internet but I do remember seeing it. The final chapter would go down as the most brutal of their affairs, seeing Riddick and Evander pummel one another. Holyfield appeared very sluggish leading into the sixth, where he surprised Bo by being the first man to drop him. Bo answered, and the action resumed, leading into the eighth where Bo returned the favor. In said eighth, Evander turned up the heat and pushed Bo into a brawl. A wobbling Bo connected with a thunderous right that dropped Evander. Holyfield answered the count, but was immediately bulldozed to the canvas again, and the fight was stopped. Riddick Bo had won the trilogy, the best heavyweight trilogy since Ali Frazier, and he'd done so in emphatic fashion. Than the best he was widely the viewed be. as the best heavyweight in the world after this win. The two friends would go opposite directions after the bout as Holyfield now, recovered Supreme well the and shocked the boxing the world. world, while Bo sought out the highly desired fight with rival Lennox Lewis. They agreed to fight in the fall of the next year. Bo took a tune-up leading to the bout against an untested competitor seeing him as a mere formality on the road to settling the score with Lewis. Heavyweight history was about to gain an interesting chapter at the cost you, of perhaps you, its biggest I loss. You, One last thing, are you going to fight Lennox Lewis next at last? I mean, right now I ain't fighting nobody. When George Foreman refused a rematch against Axel Schultz, the title was vacated and to be contested between Schultz and the white buffalo, Francois Botha. The bout was evenly contested, but most felt Schultz had done enough to win. Again, Schultz was seemingly robbed of the title when Botha was given the decision. Controversy followed the already polarizing decision when Botha tested positive for steroid usage. He claimed he was innocent, citing that his food was spiked. Court cases ensued that saw the IBF hesitate to strip Botha in favor of pushing for a rematch. Michael Moore's team intervened, citing that they were promised a title shot. Ultimately, it was settled that Moore and Scholes would contest for the once again vacant IBF title the next year, leaving Botha in a sort of limbo as his victory was declared a no contest. The presumption of innocence saw Mike Tyson return to the ring to take on Buster Mathis Jr. Once again, Tyson didn't look as formidable as he did in his previous career, but he still managed an otherwise easy win over Mathis in the third round. 
had to feel good to get a win over a buster after what happened against Douglas. In the aftermath, it was announced that Tyson would be getting a shot at WBC champion Frank Bruno in March of the next year. At year's end, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights for 1995. What a year it was featuring a plethora of solid bouts. The title was splintered entirely. George Foreman was the lineal champ. Frank Bruno was the WBC champ. Bruce Seldon was the WBA champion. The IBF title saw controversy in its vacancy. The WBO title was also vacant. The window was open for one man to emerge as the best of his generation by reunifying the title. Hopefully, this would be done before the end of the decade. I've got to give this one to the Atlantic City Express, Bruce Seldon, in his win over former champ Tony TNT Tucker. Seldon rebounded to win a major title from a losing streak. Round of the year goes to the sixth round of the Morrison Ruddick fight that saw Tommy rebound from trouble to stop Ruddick after two knockdowns. Our fight of the year is the trilogy ending bout between Riddick Bow and Evander Holyfield that saw Big Daddy win their rivalry. Speaking of Riddick, he gets Spider of the Year honors for his efforts in winning the WBO title and closing the trilogy with his rival, Evander Holyfield. Surely, the promised bout with Lennox Lewis in the coming year would prove who the actual best heavyweight in the world was. Michael Mora began his comeback trail with a unanimous decision win over Melvin Foster. It was his only fight on the year and was six months after the Foreman upset. No shame in getting decked by George Foreman. He would return over a year later in a title bout to help restore his image and legacy. Could he bounce back? Donovan Razor Ruddick would return in 1998 and fight until 2001. He made a brief three-fight comeback in 2015 before hanging up the gloves for good. He never attained the world title, but he'll be remembered forever for his contribution to the Silver Age as one of its finest challengers and contenders. It's also not too late to rename the Smash to the Razor's Edge champ. I kid, I kid, but a guy can dream. On April 23rd, Howard Cosell passed away. I covered his death in detail back in the 80s documentary during the Holmes Cop section of 1982. Rest in peace to the greatest of spoil. You don't have one of Muhammad Ali or Howard Cosell without the other one. On May 16th, Andrew Galata beat Samson Pua by fifth round stoppage. Along the way to victory, Galata bit Samson on the neck deflating his opponent as the referee didn't see the bite. On August 8th, Alex Stewart beat Jesse Ferguson in Coachella. Ernie Shavers attempted a mild comeback at the end of the year. He won one of his bouts and lost his other. He retired for good after the loss. In December, Leon Spinks finished his career in a losing effort. Overall, 1995 was very entertaining due to the chaos of the division, but there was uncertainty as the division had no clear head. Much was to be determined in the coming 1996. Four matches of notoriety happened on the night. The first was between David the Tuaminator Tua and John the Quiet Man Ruiz. Tua blasted Ruiz out in the opening round to much fanfare and upped his stock as a rising contender. The second was between Michael Grant and Corey T-Rex Sanders. Grant manhandled Sanders for all of two rounds peppering him with hooks and uppercuts until the stoppage. 
The third was between Shannon, let's go champ, the Cannon Briggs, and Darrow doing damage Wilson. It was non-stop action until the knockout at the end of the third. Briggs expended himself not holding back as he tried to snuff out Wilson. Wilson was able to secure the knockout easily once Briggs lie tired on the ropes. The final match on the night was between Andrew, powerful Paul Galata, and Danelle Doc Nicholson. It was a good squabble between the two that saw Galata on top as the bout went along. Strangely enough, despite Galata being the one who was winning the fight, he lashed out with a vicious headbutt in the fifth. Emmanuel Stewart was outraged when Wilson returned to the corner and fired him up. The fire that Doc got from Stewart wore down going into the seventh, where Galata took back control. Galata dominated the fight right up until Manny Stewart stopped the bout after round eight. Galata's use of the headbutt was perplexing, but it seemed to be the deal breaker that secured him the win. An interesting note to observe, indeed, considering the pair of fights we would next see Galata in. Galata and Nicholson would have an exhibition bout rematch in 2014 that acted as Galata's exit from boxing. Oliver McCall was also in Nicholson's corner. Originally, this was supposed to be a rematch between Frank Bruno and Lennox Lewis, but the WBC cast Lewis, its number one contender, aside in favor of the returned Mike Tyson. The matter was taken to court and the WBC won out over Lewis. Thus, the championship part one was on between WBC champion Frank Bruno and challenger Mike Tyson. The two had met in 1989 for Tyson's undisputed title, a bout that saw Iron Mike vanquish Bruno in five rounds. Much of the same happened this time, though in quicker fashion, as Tyson finally resembled his old self looking as sharp as ever in a third round wrecking job of the champion. Isn't it interesting that back in 1989, Tyson looked to be falling off against Bruno, but here in the 90s, it seemed he was getting back on track and looked the best he had so far. Sports write the best stories. Finally, Mike Tyson was again the heavyweight champion of the world, having captured the WBC title. This would be the last fight in the storied career of big bounce back Frank Bruno. He retired to similar love and fanfare as his countryman Henry Cooper, a luxury he still enjoys today. In the first of three high-profile fights in boxing's grand return to the Mecca, Madison Square Garden, former two-time heavyweight champion, terrible Tim Witherspoon, stopped Jorge Luis Gonzalez in five rounds. Gonzalez was dropped at the end of both the third and the fifth, the referee waving it off as Jorge struggled rising. After losing his O to Big Daddy Bo the previous year, Gonzalez bounced back with a TKO win before this affair. This loss to Witherspoon was the beginning of the end of Gonzalez's relevance. We'll check in on him again next year for his final chance. Before we move on, Witherspoon proclaimed he wanted a shot at Riddick, Big Daddy Bo saying Bo was the man to beat and the best heavyweight above all others. I wonder who'd win in a matchup between Terrible Tim 
and Big Daddy Bo with both at their best. How about that? What should be next for you? Oh, Reddick Bo, I like Big Daddy, me and him being him cool. But um, I think that I deserve a shot. I think he's better than all the heavyweights. I think that Reddick Bo is the one to beat, not Mike Tyson. In the final of the three main events, Evander Holyfield defeated Bobby Chez by technical knockout when Chez quit on his stool between the fifth and sixth rounds. What's that, you ask? Why is this listed second even though it's the final bout of the night? You'll see when we get to the third bout. Bobby's corner was questionable in their actions toward preserving their fighter's dignity. Was it his back or his eyes? We'll never know. Bobby charged that Evander's gloves had something on them to blind him. Holyfield had also lost his mother before the fight. Bobby would go on, even later in this year itself, to cover Holyfield's fights, and some felt he may have been a bit biased in his commentary. Evander wasn't looking too hot going into what may have been the biggest fight of his career only six months later. Still, future, it's worth noting that he wore a shirt what the that claimed says, and he was a future three-time heavyweight Holyfield. champion. We'll see, real deal. After being shafted by the WBC in their favoring of pushing Mike Tyson, Lennox Lewis steered his attention toward fellow 1988 Olympic gold medalist Ray Mercer. This is only the second bout of this heavyweight gold rush, but you're about to see why it's listed last. Lewis was expected to secure an easy enough win, but Mercer surprised the boxing world with arguably the greatest performance of his career in a back and forth chess match with Lewis. For quite literally the entire fight, Lewis and Mercer battered one another with slick precision in a battle of the wills. This was the best test of the newly tuned Lennox Lewis, and he answered the call. For all of you out there that say Lennox doesn't have a chin, you need to watch this fight again. Mercer, to his own credit, put on what may be the best performance of his career against the best heavyweight of the generation you're behind Maybe on all he's time. out punching you, that's that simple. Emmanuel Stewart like encouraged Lewis to, to pick up back. the pace midway through the fight as he felt Mercer was ahead on points. Lewis that. did just that, but still battled to a standstill with Mercer. At the final bell, both men raised their hands in victory, and rightfully so. Most observers had the fight as a draw and anticipated a rematch but the judges gave Lennox Lewis a narrow majority decision. It was the right decision, as Lewis had narrowly outlanded Mercer over the course of the fight. This war did well to gear Lennox up for his push for the title. How about a round of applause for Ray Mercer? He fought two of the 90s top three fighters back to back in good showings. When he was good, he was good. Now do you see why I listed this last? I took the Ray Mercer fight because I realized that, you know, Tyson's a presser fighter, so is Ray Mercer, so I have to go against certain guys to prepare for Mike Tyson. In the biggest boxing event Germany had seen since the 1966 title bout between Muhammad Ali and Karl Mildenberger, Former unified champion Michael Moorer took on notable contender, the gentle giant, Axel Scholes. The bout was incredibly close in a fairly even contest that resulted in a split decision win for Moorer, making him a two-time world champion. Jesus, like a bargaining cell for that now. You remember when being a two-time world champion was exclusive to Floyd Patterson and then only Floyd and Muhammad Ali? It's like everyone's becoming a multi-time world champion now. Anyway, Scholes was once again fingertips from the title and was content with the decision, citing his respect 
for double limb. On January 11th, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, was stripped of the WBO title for failing to defend against mandatory Alexander Zolkin. Jeremy Williams would act as a late replacement for Zolkin due to Zolkin suffering a cut in training. Williams was knocked out in three rounds after swinging for the home run. Perhaps this is the most impressive Henry Akinwande looked in his career. He was the new WBO champion and would have to defend against Alexander Zolkin next. Big Daddy's Home Or was it Big Daddy's Day of Reckoning? What no one else knew was that Riddick was about to meet his match as his reputation was to catch up to him tenfold. It was a matchup of the two most controversial heavyweights in the division. Now, I've covered Bo's history of quote-unquote dirty play in this timeline itself and we know that Galata was known for his questionable actions like headbutts and neck biting. Still, Bo saw the bout as nothing more than a tune up and a route to a super fight with Lennox Lewis. He came into the bout at his heaviest weight thus far and out of shape 252 pounds. Bo was immediately reminded of how you can never overlook any opponent as Galata took charge and brought the fight to Bo. He was beating Bo to the punch and overall outboxing him. However, as had been the case against Doc Nicholson, Galata saw that he couldn't put Bo away and he lashed out, this time with low blows. He was warned in the second and the third to keep his punches up. In the fourth, Galata punched Bo low again and was deducted a point as Bo received five minutes to recuperate. He only used three of the five minutes and the action resumed where Galata continued to press Big Daddy Bo. It seemed to be a bad mismatch leading into the seventh, but once again, Galata fouled down low, and he was deducted another point. He was warned that any further low blows would result in his disqualification, and he did just that later in the same round. Galata was disqualified, and Riddick Bowe, despite being badly outmatched, had a preserved record. Was Bowe outmatched, or was he shot? And how in the world was Bo expecting to compete against rival, or would-be rival, Lennox Lewis when he struggled so badly against up-and-coming Andrew Galata? A riot ensued after the bout, seeing many civilians injured. Lou Duva was caught up in the madness and had to be stretchered out. Big George Foreman protected his broadcast partners Larry Merchant and Jim Lampley from some would-be rioters. Bo's performance in this bout, unfortunately, destroyed any further chance of a dream super fight with Lennox Lewis, as Lennox pulled out of their agreement to pursue the WBC title. Eddie Futch also left this camp having had enough of Riddick's lack of discipline and dedication. A rematch was planned for which Riddick Bowe had much to prove with his career on the line. This will be the first time I mention this, but I'm sure you've noticed there's been a counter for the times that Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis have been derailed. Shame, shame, shame.
The 1996 Olympics was kicked off by the greatest himself, seeing Muhammad Ali light the Olympic flame. It was both a beautiful and sad sight to see. Atlanta 96 saw champion Felix Savan win his second gold medal when he beat Canada's David Diffiagban. Savan beat many who would go on to be professional contenders, Shannon Briggs and David Tua to name a couple, and would win a third gold medal in 2000, mirroring the success and career path of his predecessor, Teofilo Stevenson. The event also showcased the man who would be the future of the heavyweight division, Vladimir Klitschko, when he brought home super heavyweight gold for Ukraine. Vlad turned pro months later and built an impressive undefeated streak. Originally, Mike Tyson was supposed to face Lennox Lewis for the WBC title, but Lewis was paid $4 million to step aside in favor of a guaranteed bout with Tyson after a unification bout with Bruce Seldon. Originally, Tyson and Selden were scheduled for July 13th, but Tyson had bronchitis and the bout was pushed back to September 7th. Despite Tyson being WBC champ still, it was not up for grabs and therefore not a proper unification affair. If Tyson won, he'd be unified, but if Selden won, both men would retain their belts. Boxing is weird. Build his liberation. Newly crowned WBC champion Mike Tyson took on reigning WBA champion Bruce Seldon. Tyson smashed Seldon in the first round, easily securing the victory and unifying the WBC and WBA titles, though he would only remain the unified champion for another 17 days. It appeared that history was repeating itself with the rise of Mike Tyson and the unification of the division. Selden, of course, was accused of taking a dive to which he took immediate offense and claimed he didn't train 12 weeks to take a dive. Recalling his antics from earlier, Selden was well in character as the missile on this night. Instead of facing mandatory Lennox Lewis as promised, the Tyson camp vacated the WBC title on September 24th and looked toward a long desired bout against a rebounding would be rival. There went unification again. I think that says a lot for my accomplishment. This was the same night Tupac was shot after having attended the bout. He was pronounced dead six days later, and questions still remain regarding the icon's death. Rest in peace. Give them their money's worth November 9th. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, ain't nothing like two men want to win. I've been watching Mike for a long time. You know, I respect his boxing ability. I know what he brings to the table, but most important, you know, I'm, I bring a lot to the table too. Undefeated Zelko Mavrovich crushed Clifton Mitchell via TKO in the second round of their bout. Okay. So... Well, Mitchell hearkened his inner heartbreak kid and kipped up from the first knockdown. Imagine flooring someone and they kip up from it like Shawn Michaels of The Rock. Good win for Zelko, and we'll check back in with him for his career's climax in 1998. In an uneventful defense, George Foreman retained the lineage with a unanimous decision over Crawford Grimsley. Grimsley would go on to be knocked out in record time by Jimmy Thunder in his very next fight. Tommy Morrison also fought on this card, scoring a first round TKO. Morrison was looking to banish the stigma of HIV. The event being so small, quiet, and overall low key was symbolic of George's aging career winding down. A lineal title bout happening to such little buzz? Unheard of. George was approaching a 30-year career milestone, made all the more significant 
in that he was formidable at every stage. On the undercard of finally did Henry Akinwande defend his WBO title against Alexander Zalkin. The bout saw the champ get the stoppage win on cuts in the 10th. Henry scored a knockdown in the 4th and slashed Alexander's eyelid in the 6th. Zalkin's corner protested to no avail and the fight would end up as Zalkin's only unavenged loss. Akinwande was expected to fight Mike Tyson next, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Mike Tyson has to get through Evander Holyfield first, which was expected anyway. Holyfield was washed, and everyone had their money on Iron Mike anyway. Don't let revisionist history tell you otherwise either, as I see is very common, at least in YouTube boxing circles but Mike should be eyed anyway, right? Also on the undercard of finally, Michael Moore and Francois Botha rumbled for the IBF title. Some solid action in the third with Moore wobbling and pressuring Botha, though the white buffalo survived. Botha was cut over the right eye. He would be dropped twice in the 11th before being waved off in the 12th by referee Mills Lane and Michael Moore has successfully defended his IBF title for the first time in his second reign. Good win for Double M. At long last, the heavyweight dream bout between Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield had come. But was it too late to matter? Since its original inception, both men had seen drastic change. Tyson had been to prison and out of the game for four years, returning the previous year and looking well enough in his championship efforts over Bruno and Selden. Holyfield had been the champion twice, saw his career die, and saw his career resurrect to little success in efforts against Ray Mercer and Riddick Bowe. Perhaps Mike Tyson chose Evander Holyfield over Lennox Lewis because of this knowledge? Nobody knows. Tyson was by and far the betting favorite and came into the fight believing he would floor Holyfield, and rightfully so. There was also a bit in which Tyson and Holyfield talked of how it was one man's god against the others. Finally, it was time to get it on. Tyson came out with a strong right that threw Holyfield off balance and everyone believed the predictions were to be realized. The rest of the fight would shock everyone as Holyfield took the momentum and the initiative. Evander was making Mike fight going backwards and was standing toe to toe with him, exchanging blows. He smothered Mike up close and got his shots on the inside and outside. He even managed to drop Iron Mike in the sixth, to which Mike answered the count. Ultimately, Holyfield's grind paid off well in the 10th when he stunned the champion with a stiff right that buckled Tyson's head. The real deal unleashed a relentless combo that had Mike Tyson reeling into the ropes until he was saved by the bell. Mike was out on his feet and never recovered going into the 11th where the referee stopped the fight as Holyfield was again wailing away at an almost defenseless Tyson. Evander Holyfield had shocked the boxing world. He was the new WBA heavyweight champion and really did live up to that shirt he wore the night he put on a stinker against Bobby Jez 
Unbelievable. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention the headbutts that led to Tyson being cut in the bout. See, look at that. Look at that. These headbutts would be a strong point of contention in the rematch, but it's important to mention this. Listen up. Tyson always had a history of charging in during his blows at first. Knowing this, Holyfield ducked out of the way and the two clashed heads. Watching the fight back, it's clear that Evander never charged his head in to harm Tyson. As so many claim today, neither man was playing dirty here. Neither of them. Evander Holyfield became the, the first man to win WBA a portion of the title three times since Muhammad Evander, Ali's win over Leon Spinks and fully embarked on his second WBA. prime. On the undercard of Bo Galata 2, Ray Mercer was on the hunt for a win after a three-year dry spell. He'd lost to three former champions, Larry Holmes, Evander Holyfield, and Lennox Lewis. Now facing his fourth champion, Mercer needed the win to remain relevant. Terrible Tim Witherspoon, an aging two-time world champion, was looking to up his stock in the heavyweight picture. The two clashed in a back-and-forth fight that, according to CompuBox, saw Witherspoon outland Mercer in the grand scheme. Despite this, Mercer was awarded the victory and it seemed his luck had finally shifted. He wouldn't fight again until 1998 and this would be the last fight of prominence for Ray in the 90s. There it is again, Ray Mercer struggling against an 80s heavyweight. Witherspoon, meanwhile, would also continue fighting through 2003. Throughout the rest of the 90s, terrible Tim would match up against the likes of Larry Donald and Andrew Galata. The long-awaited rematch between Riddick Bowe and Andrew Galata was on. Bo came in at 235 pounds, matching his form from his peak performance against Evander Holyfield. However, this was only in the physical as Bo in no way looked to be the warrior he'd been just four years earlier. In fact, he'd overtrained and drained himself with his weight loss methods. Galata came in, once again, in top form. There was heightened security for this event to ensure there would be no repeat of the first meeting. Bo was better off this time, but Galata was once again outboxing him and beating him to the punch. Galata floored Bo in the second round, becoming only the second man to drop him. Bo answered the count and withstood a barrage from Andrew that led to a familiar sight. Galata couldn't finish the resilient Bo and resorted to a battering ram headbutt that cost him a point. Galata finished the round strong despite the cut There's he received from the headbutt that backfired on. I'm not sure which. Big Daddy bounced back in the third and dominated the fourth, Andrew seeing Galata him become down. the first man be to drop Galata. Andrew answered the count and resorted to low blows twice in the round to regain the momentum. The second of which cost him a point. Bo never fully recovered from the fouling this time and was dropped again in the fifth after another vicious combo. Bo answered the count and Galata would be warned for rabbit punching in the sixth. What's up with this guy? What followed until the fight's end remains as one of the worst beatings captured on film. Galata was having his way with Bo, 
but the former champ refused to give up and showed he had unmatched heart and determination. Riddick was going out on his shield as no one was looking to stop the bout. In round nine, Galata had had enough of the resilient bow and finished him with a final flurry. To the nuts! Bo collapsed to the canvas and Galata was disqualified again. After the fight, Bo's speech was noticeably slurred. As far as the modern day go, I think Fury Wilder 3 reminds me the most of this fight. Not the fouling, but the brutality. This would be the last notable fight of Riddick. Big really Daddy Bo's career. Gets out. If you had in a, a wholesome fighter, turn of events, Riddick Bo, Bo and, and Galata get on well in the modern day. What would you do? Bo There's told of how they got together to the and ring. went out I on one occasion. At the end of 1996, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. The heavyweight championship remained entirely splintered. George Foreman still held the lineage. The WBC title was vacant. Evander Holyfield was the new WBA champion. Michael Moore was the IBF champion. And Henry Akinwande was the WBO champion. Evander Holyfield's shocker of Mike Tyson won upset of the year. No one outside of the Holyfield camp saw the real deal winning. Our round of the year goes to round four of the Bo Galata rematch. Riddick bounced back to drop Galata only to feel the wrath of the low blow twice in the round as he and Galata went back and forth. Ring Magazine's awarded Fight of the Year to Evander Holyfield's shocking upset of Mike Tyson. The Ring's Fighter of the Year was Evander Holyfield. The real deal proved to be more than formidable, embarking onto his second prime. His showing against Tyson, who was rolling in his own comeback, put the division on notice. On October 15th, Haseen Rockman scored a win over former champion Trevor Burbick in a 10-round unanimous decision. Would Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis meet? Court judges insisted Tyson had to fight Lennox and the fans wanted it too. Tyson, like Bo before him, vacated the WBC title rather than fight Lewis. Things didn't go as planned with the Holyfield matchup for Iron Mike either which may have appeared to be a cherry pick gone wrong. Where was the former baddest man on the planet to go next? Overall, 1996 gave us the answers to some questions, but much remained to be determined. 1997 would prove to be a very decisive year, however, for the heavyweight division. Following the two demolition jobs suffered at the hands of Galata, Bo announced he was enlisting in the Marine Corps to refine his discipline and dedication. He did three days of heavy training before quitting and announced permanent retirement from boxing shortly after. Following his return to civilian life, Bo's life would regress into domestic issues, seeing one incident where he kidnapped his wife and children. He would serve jail time for this, have more domestic issues with his new wife, and make a return to the sport in 2004 before hanging up the gloves for good in 2008. Or at least so we thought. As of my writing this in September of 2021, Bo is scheduled for an exhibition against Lamar Odom. I'd say best of luck, champ, but... As of this re-recording in May of 2023, it never came to be. 
One more word on the lost Lennox Lewis super fight. Believe it or not, there are minor talks of Bo Lewis happening now, many years after its expiration date. Whatever the future holds, I can only hope and pray for the best for both gentlemen and that they can square away the bad blood they've had. Well, dreams do come true. As of Monday, January 3rd of 2021, Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis appear to have squared away their bad blood that dates back to the 1988 Olympics. It's never worth the stress and burden on your body, heart, and soul to hold a grudge. Forgiving does more for yourself than it does for others, everyone. WBO champion Henry Akinwande returned to the ring for the 1997 opener in a unanimous decision defense over Scott Welch. Other than some shady play, the fight was nothing special. Akinwande won just about every round. 21 days later, he vacated the WBO title to fight Lennox Lewis for the WBC title. Yet another testament to how insignificant the WBO was in the scope of the sanctioning bodies. Okay, I lied. The Eastern Assassin is back for one last ride here in the 90s timeline. Larry Holmes challenged IBO champion Brian Nielsen. It wasn't a major title, but if Larry wins, he can still technically say he became heavyweight champion again and at the ripe old age of 47. Well, Sadly, it wasn't to be as Nielsen was awarded the decision despite many feeling Holmes had won. Was it hometown advantage for Nielsen? Was it the continued alleged hate for the big black cloud? You decide. We'll check in again with Larry in full in a timeline of the 2000s heavyweight boxing division where he'll have his last two fights. Like I said in 1995, Larry Holmes had nothing left to prove anyway. Thanks for everything, sir. The rematch between Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall. The WBC title was again on the line, but in vacancy this time. Emmanuel Stewart was in Lewis's corner this time, and Lennox appeared to be in top form for his rematch with his former conqueror. Lewis was patient in his approach to McCall and was getting the better of him. McCall began to act strangely between the third and fourth, refusing to return to his corner. McCall produced limited offense throughout the bout. Lewis attempted to provoke McCall into fighting back, but to no avail. Lewis was landing some big punches on McCall, who was falling into a nervous breakdown. He began to cry between the fourth and fifth and was asked if he wanted to continue. He said yes, entered the fifth, and continued the bizarre behavior as Lewis wailed away. Mills Lane stopped the fight and Lennox Lewis was now a two-time heavyweight world champion. Good lord, another one. It's a bargain sale. In the aftermath, McCall explained that he was attempting to rope-a-dope Lewis with his refusal to engage, and that his breakdown was him trying to get himself in an emotional state. Perhaps drugs and rehab were somewhere in the mix as well. He was suspended and his purse withheld. He would return to boxing in November. IBF champion Michael Moore returned four months later in an otherwise boring defense over Von Bean. There was some commotion over Teddy Atlas saying Moore's son was on the phone and embarrassed of his dad or whatever. Moore didn't believe it himself, 
Butch Lewis's wrestling style promo after the bout may have been more entertaining than the bout itself. Lewis alluded to officials being swayed by the media in regards to his reputation. Oh, and Double M's reputation too. Butch Lewis has never ever bought a fighter to the ring that wasn't qualified to win. Does it look like he was supposed to be here? Yes, because we won. That, that's all, all I asked them to do was bring in neutral officials who wouldn't be biased by the local media. David Tua blasted the big O out in the 11th round after being outboxed for the majority of the fight. Tua's power was proving more and more to be a game changer as he continued his ascending the ranks. In a tough fight, George Foreman retained the lineage over Lou Savarese. The challenger started strong by taking the first half of the fight, but Foreman evened the fight up in the latter half, especially with his win of the final round. Savarese lost a point in the 11th for a low blow. George got the win by split decision, which was fair enough, but what puzzled onlookers was how George won on one card by such a wide margin of 118 to 110. Nonetheless, it was a good showing for both men. As promised and alluded to earlier, here we are, the War of the Gargantuas. The Tuominator and the President engaged in perhaps the most underrated match of the 90s, setting a new CompuBox record for punches thrown in a non-stop head-to-head -head slugfest. Ibeabuchi set the record for total punches thrown by a heavyweight. Ike outlanded Tua and was awarded the unanimous decision victory, ending the undefeated streak of Tua. After the fight, Ike complained of headaches but nothing abnormal was found. He chalked it up to demons and evil spirits. Tua would undergo elbow surgery to remove bone chips. The vacant WBO title was to be decided between former WBO champion Herbie Hyde and the measuring stick former IBF champion Tony Tucker. The Dancing Destroyer neutralized Tucker's TNT in the second round via three knockdown technical knockout. Herbie Hyde was now a two-time WBO champion, another two-time champion. June 28th was an exciting day for the division. Just wait till you see what's up next. The sound and the fury. Wait, no, not that one. That was 25 years earlier. It was finally time for Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield to get it on again. Tyson appeared to be taking this fight very seriously and portrayed himself as such in the buildup. Holyfield, again, came in more ready than ever for Tyson. Surely, this was to surpass the first fight. Well... If it didn't surpass it action-wise, it sure did spectacle-wise. The fight was proving to rhyme with the first, as Holyfield once again overcame Tyson's intimidation and swarming. Tyson looked better in this affair and was picking his spots better, still to no avail against Evander. In the second, Tyson was cut by a clash of the heads after Holyfield ducked under a lunging right from Tyson. Tyson wanted Holyfield to be punished for the butt, but Mills Lane refused after reviewing the footage. The real deal dominated the first two rounds. The third round saw Tyson unleash a vicious combination on Holyfield, but he was unable to deter the champion. Frustrated that the first fight's fate appeared to be on the horizon, 
Tyson bit Holyfield's ear in the clinch. Holyfield jumped in pain, signaling Lane to look at his now bleeding ear. Tyson asserted that the damage came from a punch to which Lane called his bluff. Tyson was deducted two points by Lane after almost being disqualified. When the action resumed, Holyfield and Tyson were fired up and the crowd was buzzing. In the clinch, again, Tyson bit Holyfield's other ear. There was no halt to the action this time as the two fought to the bell. When the bite was discovered, Tyson was disqualified between rounds. After the disqualification, Tyson went berserk, desperate to continue fighting Holyfield. Truth be told, everyone, including yours truly, wanted to see more, and it's too bad this fight had to end the way it did. Tyson also got into it with some fans who threw a water bottle at him. In an interview right after, Holyfield said that he already forgave Tyson because of his undying faith in Jesus Christ. The Nevada State Athletic Commission fined Tyson $3 million and revoked his boxing license. This began a dark streak for the once glorious champion. Kid Dynamite was losing control. This was the first time that a heavyweight title bout ended by disqualification since the 1941 bout between Joe Lewis and Buddy Bear where Bear's manager refused to leave the ring. The bout was compared to other bizarre boxing events like the Phantom Punch bout between Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston and the long count fight between Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey. As soon as he butted me, I watched him. He had me holding, and he looked right at me, and I saw him, and he was going for, and he kept going for, and he butted me again. He been butting me for two fights. What am I to do? This is my career. I can't continue getting butted like that. Like, I got children to raise, and we and we complained about the um the first fight. I got to retaliate. Holyfield is not the tough warrior everyone says he is. He got a little nick on him there, and he quit. I got an eye. I got one eye, and he got ears. If he take one, I got another one. I'm ready to fight. He didn't want to fight. I'm ready to fight him right now. I did address it. I addressed it in the ring. Look at me. Look at me. I got to go home. My kids are going to be scared of me. Look at me, man. In the first defense in his second reign as WBC champion, Lennox Lewis won via disqualification over undefeated Henry Akinwande. Lewis was in firm control of the bout before it was stopped due to Akinwande's excessive holding. This was also only the second time that two British-born boxers fought for the heavyweight title. As a reminder, Akinwande vacated the WBO title to face Lennox. Yet another big fight now had ended by disqualification in the heavyweight division. Something's gone on here. Three months later, Lennox Lewis engaged Andrew Galata in his second defense of the WBC title. As you can imagine, this was supposed to be the super fight with Riddick Bowe, but we know how that ended. Galata was expected to put up a grand affair against Lewis after his efforts against Bo, but in a shocker, Lewis finished Galata in the first round with two dominant knockdowns and a lopsided display. Galata himself appeared stunned on the mat from how easily he'd been squared away. In the aftermath of the bout, it was revealed that Galata had a lidocaine injection before the bout for knee pain. It may have compromised his performance and he suffered a life-threatening seizure after the bout, of which he'd be resuscitated and make a full recovery. He was fined $5,000 and sued the doctor who administered the shot for $21 million. The case was settled for $1 million. And it's important to note that none of this detracts from Lewis's win. He looked to be in his absolute peak and pinnacle on this night. Now, about that checkup we mentioned earlier. 
Any remaining questions about Jorge Luis Gonzalez were answered with expedience when Michael Grant eviscerated him in the first round. Grant made a great statement and Gonzalez would fade away, retiring in 2002. At least he went undefeated for the rest of the 90s, one of those wins coming over Alex Stewart. In a rematch of their 1994 title bout for the exact same titles, minus the lineage, Evander Holyfield and Michael Moore went to war over the titles. The first four rounds were evenly contested and there was concern in the air for Holyfield that it would rhyme with the first bout especially after the clash of heads that cut Holyfield. Moore took advantage using his jab leading into the fifth, where he and observers were shocked when Holyfield decked Moore, sending him to the canvas. Moore answered the count and recovered well enough to have a good sixth round. Again, things looked to be mirroring the first fight as Moore was also dropped in that affair. In the seventh, this fight proved to be very different as Holyfield again stunned Moore twice before dropping him for the second time. He was knocked down again by a Holyfield uppercut in the round to which he would again answer the count. What heart? In the eighth, Holyfield dropped Moore twice more and again Moore answered the count showcasing that he had amazing heart and will of his own. He survived the round and ringside Dr. Flip Hemansky stopped the bout despite pleas from Moore to let him continue. Evander Holyfield had just unified the WBA and IBF titles in a remarkable effort against former conqueror Michael Moore. This was Double M's last fight in the 90s. He would return at the turn of the millennium in 2000. On the undercard, David Tua easily dispatched of Jeff Lally in two rounds to jumpstart his road back after the close loss to Ibea Bucci. In the main event, 48-year-old George Foreman fought an impressive bout in his defense of the lineage against Shannon, let's go champ, the Cannon Briggs. However, the judges didn't see it the same as most onlookers and rewarded Briggs the win. Shannon Briggs was the new lineal heavyweight champion of the world. This wound up being the last bout in the illustrious career of George Foreman. His second career only served to hammer home what everyone had already known deep down. George Foreman was arguably the greatest heavyweight of all time. He competed in the two arguable best eras for heavyweights and been on top of the mountain in both. His success outside of the ring still lingers to this day as George is also one of the greatest salesmen of all time. All well earned to the greatest comeback story in boxing history. A story you can again Catch on the big screen as of right now as George finally has his own movie. From heel to face, from villain to hero, from dark to light, ladies and gentlemen, Big George Foreman. Thank you, sir. At the conclusion of 1997, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Finally, there was a unified champion in Evander Holyfield after he avenged his loss to Michael Moore to bring the WBA and IBF titles together. Lennox Lewis was rolling as the WBC champion. Shannon Briggs was the new lineal heavyweight champion of the world. Speaking of which, our upset of the year goes to Shannon Briggs and his very questionable win over Big George Foreman for the heavyweight lineage. Had Foreman been awarded the victory, we may have gotten Lennox Lewis 
and George Foreman. Our round of the year is a tie between the 7th and 8th rounds of Holyfield Moore 2. Moore fought back through the storm against a dominant Holyfield before the bout was stopped by the ringside doctor. Amazing effort from both warriors. Our fight of the year goes to the unexpected power punch a thon between David Tua and Ike Ibiabuchi. Both men looked great after the fight and looked to be on their way to making waves in the division. Once again, Ring Magazine awarded Evander Holyfield as Fighter of the Year. The real deal continued to dazzle in his second prime with notable rematch wins over Mike Tyson and Michael Moore. Looks like the man just has your number if your name's Mike. He was the unified WBA IBF champion and boxing fans were looking forward to a potential unification bout with WBC champion Lennox the Lion Lewis. On March 18th, Chris Bird beat Burt Cooper by unanimous decision. On May 16th, Andrew Galata and merciless Ray Mercer were supposed to fight, but Galata had to pull out due to an injury. It was rescheduled for August 16th, but Mercer had to pull out for neck surgery. Unfortunately, the bout never happened. Shannon Briggs and Chris Bird were also scheduled to fight on the night. On September 27th, Olog Maskiev TKO'd Alex Stewart in Moscow. On October 30th, Carl, the truth, Williams had his last bout in New York. Williams was a solid contender who never won the big one. Mike Tyson had banished himself from the title picture and the division as a whole. It would be a while before we saw Iron Mike again in the world of boxing. Lennox Lewis looked incredible having bounced back 100 fold from his loss to McCall three years earlier. The heavyweight picture was boiling down. Overall, 1997 was a shell shocker of a year that finally saw a branch of unification. Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis had emerged from the deep waters of the heavyweight division as the two best. Shannon Briggs held the lineage and stood in the way of a potential unification bout between Lewis and Holyfield. Surely 1998 would bring us closer to true unification. Just who does the mountaintop belong to? Touted as March Badness, for obvious reasons, Lennox Lewis and Shannon Briggs engaged in a unification bout for the Lineal and WBC titles. It was a slugfest that saw Briggs take the fight to Lewis, only to be outsmarted and overwhelmed mid-fight by a calculated lion. Once again, Lewis proved more than capable under fire. For all those who say he doesn't have a chin, again, check here. He was now the unified lineal and WBC heavyweight champion and the boxing world looked toward a unification bout with unified WBA IBF champion Evander Holyfield. WBO titleist Herbie Hyde returned and vanquished Damon Reed in record time. No, seriously, it was a record for a heavyweight title bout how fast Hyde stopped Reed. 52 seconds, beating out James J. Jeffries' 1900 victory over Jack Finnegan. There was one knockdown to which Reed rose and was cut. The referee looked to second guess himself in letting Reed continue and looked to separate the men before Hyde could further dissect his victim. As addressed by the announcers, the WBO should have been questioning their own legitimacy by sanctioning this sort of fight. The WBO seemed to be out for the opposite of legitimacy. 
if you're going to build a fight as the power and the glory, it's got to live up to said title. And this fight did not do as such. Evander Holyfield defended the WBA and IBF titles against challenger Von Bean in a less than impressive effort. Though he'd won the unanimous decision after dropping Bean in the 10th, Holyfield's age was beginning to show. Clearly, he'd fallen off from his impressive second run that was highlighted against Mike Tyson and Michael Moore, an unfortunate reality heading into potential unification. Uh, was Vaughn being the metaphorical sign of things going down for champions who fought him? First Moore, now Holyfield looking worse? Nah, I'm just being dramatic. Also, the post-fight interviews in the ring, once again, had Butch Lewis stealing the show, this time so profoundly that Jim Gray shifted the broadcast from the ring interviews. Lewis was upset at the referee for how he handled Holyfield knocking Bean down. They exchanged some words face to face too. WBO champion Herbie Hyde was back. This time a repeat of the Tony Tucker matchup as he won by three knockdown rule over Willie Fisher in the second round. Hyde slipped to the canvas himself going for the kill after the first knockdown. On the undercard of the Battle of the Giants, David Tua continued his comeback dominance with a first round demolition of Eric Curry. In the main event, unified heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis took on challenger Zelko Maverich. It was a well-contested bout that saw Lewis almost exhaust himself as Maverich took the best he had to offer. The challenger never managed any meaningful offense despite this, and Lewis won a lopsided unanimous decision over Zelko. Rumors swirled on if the unification bout was next. The contract was signed on November 24th for an early 1999 date. Dr. Stillhammer had accumulated an impressive undefeated streak coming into this bout with journeyman Ross Purity. He was largely expected to continue said run, but Purity shocked all by surviving Vlad's dominance over 10 rounds. He floored and exhausted Vlad in the 10th after the Olympic gold medalist neglected to pace himself. Klitschko survived the round, but his corner stopped the fight in the 11th as Purity was battering their fighter. It was a stunning derailing of the young star's career. Purity rejected a rematch offered two years later and instead faced Vlad's brother Vitaly on December 8th, 2001. He was stopped by Dr. Iron Fist in 11 rounds. In an IBF heavyweight title eliminator, David Tua took on Haseem Rockman. Rockman managed to outbox Tua and keep him at bay for the majority of the fight. In the ninth, Tua hit Rockman with a left hook after the bell that he never recovered from. But don't get it twisted, it wasn't a dirty play by Tua. Tua would finish him in the tenth, and once again his power had bailed him out of a potential loss. The comeback of the Tua Minator continued strong. They would rematch five years later to a draw. Rockman knocked Tua down at the very end of the fight, but the knockdown didn't count. Feels unfair considering how the first fight was shaped by a shot after the bell. The fight was called a split decision draw. To conclude 1998, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis stood above the pack and were scheduled to determine who the real king of the jungle was. Upset of the year easily goes to Ross Purity and his shocker over Vladimir Klitschko. 
The family name took a bit of a hit, especially considering that this was Vlad's first fight in front of his home country. The fourth round of Lewis Briggs is taking round of the year. After surviving an onslaught in the earlier rounds, Lewis recuperated well and dropped Briggs twice in the fourth while still taking some of the best Briggs had to offer. Again, this one's for all of you that don't think Lewis has a chin. The slugfest between Lennox Lewis and Shannon Briggs is taking the Fight of the Year award. Lewis weathered the storm well to secure the victory. In a clean sweep of the awards, Lennox Lewis tops the year as its best fighter. He was aging like fine wine and looking primed heading into the new year. While Mike Tyson was away from the sport, he did some work with the World Wrestling Federation, appearing at WrestleMania 14. Remember, he was originally supposed to appear back in 1990, but Tokyo Douglas happened. In May, Tony Tucker had his last bout in a first round knockout win over Billy Wright. On July 4th in Australia, as mentioned in a timeline of the 1970s heavyweight boxing division, Joe Bugner would become the oldest champion up to that point when he beat James Bone Crusher Smith for the WBF title. On December 9th, the boxing world lost Archie Moore. When you look up longevity in the dictionary, there's a picture of the old mongoose. No explanation, just a picture. Moore's career will be covered in greater detail down the line here on Boxingpedia. Overall, 1998 inched a bit closer to answering the ultimate question, who's the best heavyweight in the world and of this generation? 1999 was guaranteed to have the answer as Lewis and Holyfield agreed to fight for all the marbles. To open the year for the heavyweights, Mike Tyson made his return to the ring against controversial former IBF champion, sort of, Francois Botha. The bout, controversial as it would be, is perhaps most famous for what may be Iron Mike's most badass and epic entrance ever, seeing him try to recapture his apex intimidation to the tune of DMX's intro from It's Dark and Hell is Hot. Would it work, or had Tyson's mystique been vanquished for good? Let's find out. Both have managed to outbox and outpoint the rusty Tyson over the first four rounds, before being floored in round five. Botha tried to answer the count, but slumped to the canvas multiple times before referee Richard Steele stopped the fight. Over the course of the fight, Tyson allegedly tried to break Botha's arm in the clinch. Logically promoted as undisputed, the two men who emerged atop the 1990s mountain met to decide the undisputed heavyweight world champion. The history of division within this decade led to this fight, dating back to Riddick Bowe's defeating of Evander Holyfield and refusing to defend the title against Lennox Lewis. Lewis and Holyfield were on a collision course of their own, dating back to 1993 when Holyfield was prevented from unifying against Lewis. At last, they would meet, and at last, we would have an undisputed heavyweight champion. There was a bit of tension between the two in the buildup as well. On fight night, Lewis is largely considered to have outworked and outboxed Holyfield, but the judges did not see it this way and instead had the fight as a split decision draw. 
the punch stat showed that Lewis did more than enough to secure the victory. Clearly, this was an effort to keep the public invested for a potential rematch. After all this time, there was still no undisputed champion, though many saw Lewis as the uncrowned undisputed champion. It was a travesty, and the sanctioning bodies benefited greatly from the ordered rematch scheduled for November. Undefeated heavyweight contender Ike Ibiabuchi met undefeated middleweight turned heavyweight Chris Bird. Ibiabuchi was able to stop Bird in the fifth after two knockdowns. Bird would rebound to become one of the most notable contenders of the 2000s. His notable victories include those over Vitaly Klitschko, David Tua, and Evander Holyfield. Unfortunately for the president, this would be his last bout and he would never challenge the winner of Lewis Holyfield. A promising young career was derailed by Ike's legal issues. He was charged with sexual assault and later found to have bipolar disorder. Upon release, he violated parole in 2016 and is currently struggling with immigration issues as he waits for his swearing in ceremony for citizenship. What could have been? For Ike Ibeabuchi. Maybe his plans of a comeback will still materialize. The Klitschko family name was at risk of extinction when brother Vitaly Klitschko took on WBO champion Herbie Hyde. Klitschko dominated Hyde with two knockdowns before winning by stoppage in the second when the referee felt Hyde had had enough. It was a convincing victory for Vitaly and brought great press to the family name. Herbie Hyde fizzled out from here as a heavyweight, eventually dropping down to cruiserweight and retiring in 2010. In a controversial result, former lineal champion Shannon Briggs and Francois Botha fought to a draw. A draw, despite the fact that Botha appeared to do enough for the victory. The fans and announcers openly disagreed and it seemed Briggs had been saved from another loss akin to the George Foreman matchup. Briggs later told of how this was his most painful fight of his career. A torn left bicep, stomach ulcer, poor training conditions in the form of bad altitude and too cold weather, broken ribs during the fight, cauliflower ears, and stitches over both his eyes. It's amazing he was even able to hang in there and hold his body together, wow. Big physical and mental beatdown, but the cannon pressed on. It was the final 1990s fight for both men. See you in the 2000s. Let's go, champ. New WBO champion Vitaly Klitschko, redeemer of the family name, returned four months later. After two knockdowns, he scored a third round technical knockout over Ed Mahone. The action was stopped after Mahone rose wobbly from said second knockdown. On the undercard, David Tua squared away Shane Sutcliffe in two rounds. Tua had rebounded well from the loss to Ike and was etching closer and closer to the title picture. A fight that had actually been a long time coming. Its inception dates back to Tyson's undisputed title reign when a rising Orland Norris never got a shot at Tyson because of Tokyo Douglas. The fight in no way lived up to the supposed hype as it lasted one round. Tyson had Norris on the defensive until the end of the round where Tyson dropped Norris after the bell in the clinch. He was deducted two points, but Norris refused to answer the bell for the second round citing that he'd injured his knee in the fall. Tyson accused Norris of faking the injury. It was ruled a no contest. Mama Mia, oh me oh my, mother of pearl. Holy shnikes, whatever you wanna say, you're in for a treat if you don't know this one. In what would go down as the Ring Magazine Knockout of the Year, Derek Jefferson, and Maurice Harris engaged in one of those rare real-life Rocky fights. Let's take it from the top. 
Jefferson brought the fight to Harris from the jump, it culminating in two vicious knockdowns in the second. Harris struck back and dropped Jefferson during a wild exchange. Jefferson rose and turned the tide back in his favor in a toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange as the round came to a close. In fact, he almost dropped Harris again. The third saw Jefferson maintain control, even battling through some stiff shots from Harris. He landed a sick uppercut that cost Harris his mouthpiece. The fourth saw the same, Jefferson launching Harris's mouthpiece again. The slugfest continued as Jefferson absorbed Harris's offense in the fifth before dropping him again in the sixth. Harris answered, and the momentum swung in his favor as he wailed away on Jefferson before a decapitating left hook landed, ending Harris's night. I don't know who in the world would have survived that left. It held Jefferson's full 35 pound weight advantage and all his will to survive in it. As evil a left hook you will ever see. Ring Magazine rightfully awarded the bout knockout of the year, as mentioned earlier. I highly recommend you go watch this one for yourself in full. Seriously, I almost considered giving it the special must see fight treatment, it's that good. You want a buffet of brain damage? This is the one for you. Continuing the streak in one of the sweetest knockouts you'll ever see, Olag Maskev floored Haseen Rockman through the ropes and out of the ring in the eight rounds of their bout. Rockman was unable to beat the count and returned to the ring as a melee ensued amongst fans. This loss, coupled with the controversial knockout at the hands of David Tua, hurt Rockman's ranking and pushed his shot for the title back to 2001. The two met again seven years later in a match for the WBC title held by Rockman. Maskev, again, stopped Rockman for the win, this time in the 12th and final round. And before we move on, wow, that's two spectacular knockouts on one night. What a night. Unfinished business, the search for the truth. And that it was. Originally scheduled for September and then pushed back to November, Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield met to definitively settle who the best heavyweight was, on paper at least. Lewis was already viewed as the best in the world. It was seven years to the day since Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, had dethroned Evander Holyfield as undisputed champion. The real deal did better this time around, but Lewis still did the better work. Round seven saw a firework end, with the two blasting another heading toward the bell. When the dust settled, Lennox the Lion Lewis was awarded a unanimous decision and became the first undisputed heavyweight champion of the world since old rival Riddick Bowe in 1992. What a journey in comeback for Lennox. He beat the best of the best and arguably did better against similar opponents he shared with Riddick Bowe. The Lion was in his rightful place as THE King of the Jungle and the heavyweight division was finally unified. Undefeated Michael Grant and controversial Andrew Galata contested one another in the WBC title eliminator to decide who would challenge undisputed Lennox Lewis. Grant was dropped twice in the first round and would survive. Both Galata and Grant were deducted for low blows in the third and sixth, respectively. In the tenth, Galata was dropped by Grant and informed the referee that he no longer wished to continue. Michael Grant had come back to preserve his undefeated streak, leaving Galata 
in further turmoil. In the last notable fight of the 1990s and in what would be Vitaly's first time going past six rounds, he retained the WBO title when Obed Sullivan failed to answer the bell for the 10th round. Klitschko was winning on all cards and well ahead having won every round. Again, this was the last notable bout of the 1990s, fittingly starring one of the 2000s biggest heavyweight faces. At the end of 1999 and the 1990s as a whole, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Lennox Lewis had proven himself and stamped his moniker as the Lion on history. He had conquered the heavyweight division, overcoming the unexpected. He never secured the super fight with Riddick Bowe, but history shows that he may not have needed to as he's seen as arguably the greatest heavyweight of all time. He beat them all and had nothing left to prove, but would go into the 2000s to continue his reign. Upset of the year goes to Vitaly Klitschko in his win over Herbie Hyde for the WBO title. Hyde was favored to win and was floored in two rounds. Our round of the year goes to round seven of the Lewis Holyfield undisputed rematch. Fight of the year goes to the Grant Galata fight, which saw Grant come back from being dropped twice in the first round and stop Galata in the 10th. Without a shadow of a doubt, the undisputed champion is our fighter of the year. Lennox Lewis was the best of the best. On January 3rd, the boxing world lost one of its great warriors who never won the big one. Irish Jerry Quarry competed against some of the best heavyweights the sport had ever seen and did well enough in his own right. He'd been entered into the Hall of Fame back in 1995 and suffered from dementia until his death. Rest in peace, champ. On March 28th, the WWF Brawl for All, a boxing tournament held by the WWF, concluded with winner Bart Gunn getting a match with Butterbean in WrestleMania 15. Butterbean floored Gunn in 35 seconds. This entire tournament was a mess. Having a shoot fighting tournament in scripted sports entertainment is begging for trouble. Here's another event for another video for another channel down the line. Be looking out. On the subject of Butterbean, Eric Esch brought fireworks and endless entertainment to the boxing world in the 90s, starting in 1994. He would continue through to 2007 before returning for one-offs in 2009, 2012, and 2013. Do yourself a favor and look up some highlights of the Enigma. You won't be disappointed. Of course, I'll cover Butterbean down the line here on Boxingpedia. On June 6th, Alex Stewart had his last bout against Jorge Luis Gonzalez in Las Vegas. He was stopped in the second round. On June 18th in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Bone Crusher Smith had his last match against former rival Larry Holmes in a losing effort in which he was stopped in eight rounds. It was a rematch of their 1984 bout in which Holmes also stopped Smith in 12 rounds. On September 3rd, the big cat Cleveland Williams passed on. He was one of the great contenders of the 50s and 60s, having fought the best his era had to offer. His career will be covered in greater detail down the line. Jose Ribalta finished his career on October 8th. He spent the 90s facing off against valiant competition in mostly losing efforts. His opponents included Tim Witherspoon, Bruce Seldon, Frank Bruno, Michael Dokes, Larry Holmes, Tony Tubbs, Vitaly Klitschko, and Razor Ruddick. Ribalta was most notable for his 1986 bout with Mike Tyson in which he came just a minute shy of taking Tyson the distance. Overall, 
1999 was the year the boxing world had waited for since Riddick Bowe trashed the WBC belt at the end of 1992. There was finally an undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Just what would the 2000s hold in store for the heavyweight? In no particular order, here are some bouts that happened in the 2000s that are 90s bred. The bizarre Mike Tyson, Andrew Galata fight. Lennox Lewis easily squaring away Michael Grant. The Holyfield Ruiz trilogy that saw Holyfield win the first, Ruiz win the second, and the third be a controversial draw. The Holyfield Rockman bout that saw Rockman suffer the horrible swelling after a headbutt and Holyfield win by split decision. Roy Jones Jr. finally stepping up to heavyweight and taking the WBO strap off John Ruiz. Michael Moore and David Tua, which saw Tua floor Moore in 30 seconds. Lennox Lewis and David Tua, which saw the Lion put on a boxing lesson. Ray Mercer and Shannon Briggs, which saw Briggs come away with the win. Lennox Lewis and Vitaly Klitschko, which saw the controversial TKO6 finish in favor of Lennox who would retire after the bout. Ray Mercer versus Vladimir Klitschko, which saw Vlad stop Ray in the sixth. Spoilers, but we'll get there anyway. And however, there was one match that had been lost that we finally got in 2002. is on. Finally, Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson met in a bout that acted as the true exit of the 1990s. The build-up and hype was insane as Tyson was a loose cannon completely out of control. There was trouble finding a venue as most states refused to grant Tyson a license. Tennessee gave Tyson the nod and the pyramid would see the bout. Lewis put his unified lineal WBC IBF and newly gained Ring Magazine recognition up for grabs. The bout saw Lennox Lewis dominate Mike Tyson after surviving the initial onslaught from Tyson. He knocked Tyson out in the eighth and silenced any doubt that he was the best of his generation. The 1990s was finished with few loose ends left. If I had to reward a round of the decade, I'm giving it to the 10th round of the first Holyfield Bo fight. Bo nearly eviscerated Holyfield, who returned from near oblivion to shake Bo until a back and forth slugfest ended the round. As for the fight of the decade, I'm giving it to the first bout between Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bo in 1992. The two men destroyed one another, with Bo coming out on top to capture the undisputed crown and splinter it until Lennox Lewis brought it back together in 1999. And the fighter of the decade, as he so rightfully earned, is Lennox the Lion Lewis. He beat the best, avenged his loss, and left zero doubt who the king was. Even more impressive was that Lewis was the first British champion in a century and re-established his country as a premium force in boxing. The United Kingdom still holds a tight grip over the heavyweight division and sport today. The rivalry of the decade, as if there could be any other, was the Holyfield Bowl trilogy. I highly recommend that you go and watch all three fights to completion. You will not be disappointed. If I had to rank the years of the 90s, they would go 1998, 1999, 1990, 1993, 1991, 
1992, 1994, 1997, 1995, and 1996. 94, 95, 96, and 97 could all honestly trade the number one spot. If I had to rank the top 10 fighters of the decade from bottom to top, they would go Andrew Galata, Donovan Razor Ruddick, Tommy the Duke Morrison, Merciless Ray Mercer, Double M Michael Moore, Iron Mike Tyson, Big George Foreman, Evander the Real Deal Holyfield, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, and Lennox, the Lion, Lewis. A huge thank you to every single one of the warriors listed and unlisted who made the 1990s the last spectacular decade for heavyweights. Well, everyone, there's only one thing left to do. End this trilogy as I've promised with the what if tournament I've always wanted to see. Just what would happen if the 10 best fighters of the 70s and 90s respectively engaged in a tournament to crown a unified heavyweight champion? Well, you can find out right now. The link is in the description and there should be a bubble on screen for you to go to find out who the best heavyweight ever is. See you over there, and stay frosty, everyone. This is the Charles Jackson, author of the Boxing Encyclopedia. See you soon. And before we go, if you'd like the best highlight reel that I've personally seen of the 1990s heavyweight division, check out the masterpiece that is We Talk Boxing's 90s Furious Angels cut. The link is in the description, in the pinned comment, and there should be a bubble on screen. Amazing stuff, and thank you, WT, for the love over on Reddit a while back. I told you you'd be in this bad boy. All right, y'all. Peace.